yes all right let's start guys let's make the most of this session today we're going to be doing the meetings chapter all right and i know this is a chapter which a lot of us are very very scared just because of the length of this chapter so my objective is to just help you you know quickly revise this chapter so that you can straight away open it directly the day before the examination because when we sit with this chapter i'm very sure you must have noticed after a certain point we tend to lose patience right so and it feels like this chapter is going on and on and on and on so that's the whole objective we are going to be doing the revision we're going to try to finish off as much as we can as well as we can in these two and a half years uh, in these two and a half hours all right so let's begin we'll start with the basic concepts try participating as much as you can in the chat box because that's going to keep you awake no writing anything your objective will be just listening absorbing revising all right keep repeating as much as you can along with me so that it retains in your memory all right so on that note come on let's begin so starting with the very first concept let me share my screen starting with the very first concept register of members now every company has to maintain a separate register of members a separate register of debenture holders and if it has any other security it has to maintain a separate register for each kind of security in what form should it be maintained see generally form numbers i do not really stress upon but here these two form numbers you should be knowing that form mgt1 is for register of members and form mgt2 is for debenture holders this is important from the perspective of your mcq exam mcq questions all right so every company has to maintain a separate register of members a separate register of debenture holders and a separate register of each kind of security holders from when should it maintain this register it will have to maintain this register from the beginning from the date of incorporation in what form register of members in form mgt1 register of the venture holders in form mgt2 right now where should we keep this register we have three options we can either keep this register at the registered office or we can keep this register in any other place but in the same city town or village same ctv same city town or village where the registered office is situated or we can also keep this register in any other place but in india where more than one tenth of the total members live where do we keep this register come on repeat along with me we either keep it at the registered office in the registered office or some other place but in the same city town village where the registered office is situated or we can keep it in any other place also but at any other place has to be in india we can't keep it in the us in india where more than one tenth of the total number of members live if i want to keep the register outside of my registered office if i don't want to keep it in the registered office if i want to keep it in any of these two places then i need permission of my shareholders in the form of a special resolution when will we make an entry in this register as soon as the board of directors approve the allotment or transfer within 7 days you got to remember this time limit of 7 days within 7 days entry has to be made in the register all right then remember in case we have 50 or more than 50 then we need an index also if we have 50 or more than 50 so i will say greater than or equal to 50 in other words if we have less than 50 we don't need index only if we have 50 or more than 50 members only then we will need an index okay this index will have details about all the shareholders just like how it's easy for you to refer your textbook with an index same way it will be easy to refer the register with the help of this index all right so what we are going to do is as we keep learning as we come across limits we will keep making a note of the limits what are the important things we've come across till now which we might forget you tell me what is the form for register of members what is the form for register of members form mgt1 and what is the form for register of debenture holders form mgt2 you don't have to write this along with me okay whatever i write in this notebook i will make sure i somehow send it to you all so this notebook you don't have to write register of members form mgt1 register of the venture holders form mgt2 these are the forms that we have come across what are the number of days that we have come across until now 
in case you want to make an entry in the register of members or in the register of debenture holders, when should we make this entry? We should make this entry within seven days, right? And then one more limit, other limits. What are the other limits that we have come across until now? When do we need the index? We need the index only if I have 50 or more than 50 members. You know how they will twist the question in the examination? Exactly 50 members. Do I need a register? Do I need an index? What will your answer be? Exactly 50. Yes, I need an index. Understanding? So come on, every company will have to maintain a separate register of members, a separate register of debenture holders, a separate register for each category of security holders. In what form shall it be maintained? MGT1 for register of members, MGT2 for register of debenture holders. And when should the entry be made? Entry should be made here within seven days, within seven days from the approval of the allotment or the transfer by the board. Where will we keep this register? We can either keep this register at the registered office or in some other place, but same city, town or village, the registered office is situated or any other place, some other city also, but in India, where more than one tenth of the total members live. If I want to keep the register in these two places, then I need a special resolution. Then we need that, then we learned that in case I have a register, in case I have 50 or more than 50 members, in case I have 50 or more than 50 members, then we also need an index, right? Now, how long are we going to preserve this register? We're going to preserve the register of members permanently, but how long are we going to preserve the debenture holders register? For eight years, but eight years from then. Eight years, everybody remembers, but eight years from then, eight years from the date of redemption. So one more time limit we have come across. We have come across preservation. How long are we going to preserve the register? If it is register of members, we will preserve it permanently. But if it is register of debenture holders, we will preserve it for eight years. But eight years from then, eight years from the date of redemption. So whatever is difficult in this chapter, we will keep putting down in the notebook so that we can revise it very easily the day before the examination. Now, what if the securities are in DMAT form? If the securities are in DMAT form, then the company is not going to maintain any register. In that case, we will go to the depository. The depository will be maintaining a register of beneficial owners. The depository is register of beneficial owners. That itself will be considered as register for the purpose of the act. You need to remember the name of the register. What is the name of the register? Register of beneficial owners. The register of beneficial owners maintained by whom? Maintained by the depository, right? So this register of beneficial owners, which is maintained by the depository, we will treat this register itself as register for the purpose of Companies Act. But when only if the securities are held in DMAT form. Now you tell me what if the securities are jointly purchased? That is what if there are joint shareholders? Then any one's name written in the register is enough? No, all the joint shareholders name have to be written in the register. In which sequence? On the basis of age? On the basis of alphabetical order? No, in the sequence which who will tell the company? The joint shareholders, they themselves will tell the company that whose name has to be written first, whose name has to be written second. Does that make a difference whose name is written first, whose name is written second? Yes, who, which, whichever joint shareholder's name is written first, that joint shareholder will have seniority. That joint shareholder will get priority. Voting and all, the joint shareholder whose name is written first, that joint shareholder gets priority. Notice of the meeting is sent to which joint shareholder? That joint shareholder whose name is written first. So this was a quick discussion of the register of members. Now, can the company close the register of members? Yes, at a time. How many days can it close it? At a time, it can close it for 30 days. But all through the year put together, it can close for 45 days all through the year. But before closing the register, seven days in advance, it has to give a notice. It has to put an advertisement informing the people that on this date, we are going to close the register. But why does a company even want to close the register? Because imagine a company like Reliance Industries Limited, every second the shareholders are changing. Every second the list of members is changing. So how will we decide to which shareholder we should give dividend, to which shareholder we should give bonus shares, to which shareholder we must give rights shares? Just a moment, guys. There seems to be a problem. 
uh, could you please make me the host, the admin? Thank you. Yeah. So listen, why do we need to close the register of members? We need to close the register of members because of one simple reason, and that is the list of members will keep changing. But we need to make a decision that to whom should we pay dividend, to whom should we pay bonuses. So we will close the register, and on that date, whoever are the members of the company, on that date, whoever's name is there in the register of members, only to those people I will give the dividend only to those people i will give the bonuses so conclusion can i close the register yes point number two for how many days can i close the register at a time at a time i can close it for 30 days and all put together in the entire year put together i can close it for 45 days but before i close the register how many days in advance i have to give a notice informing the public that on this date i'm going to close the register seven days in advance this was our second concept regarding closing the register of members. Now coming to the third concept, foreign registers. Foreign registers are not mandatory. Please listen carefully. Foreign registers are not mandatory, which means it is at the option of the company. If the company wants, it is anyways having a register in India. In addition to this, it can have one more register outside India. It is anyways having a register in India. In addition to this, it can have one more register where? Outside India. In such cases, the register in India is called the principal register and the register outside India is called the foreign register. Where is this foreign register kept? Anywhere outside India. It should be in the same format as the principal register. The foreign register is considered to be a continuation of the principal register. It will be considered to be a part of the principal register. In case we want to create this foreign register, what are we going to write in this foreign register? In this foreign register, we will write details of all our foreign shareholders. For example, let us say my company is incorporated, has registered office in Bangalore. Okay, so in Bangalore, I'm keeping one register that will be principal register. In this register, I will only write details about my shareholders in India. I can also keep one foreign register in New York, one foreign register in London. Yes, I can have multiple foreign registers also. All these foreign registers will keep a record of the shareholders outside India. These foreign registers will follow the same format as the principal register in India. In case I'm going to keep foreign register like this, then I have to inform the ROC when within 30 days of opening the foreign register, I have to inform the ROC. I have to inform the ROC. ROC, listen, I have opened a foreign register. I am keeping it in New York. After some days, I decided to move the location from New York to London. Now, again, within 30 days, I have to inform ROC. ROC, listen, I had told you, no, it is in New York. Now I have moved it to London. Then whenever I make any entry in the foreign register, one copy of the entry, one photocopy of the entry, I am supposed to send it to the registered office in India. This is an extremely important point, guys. Whenever I make an entry in the foreign register, within 15 days, I am supposed to send a copy of that entry to the registered office in India. All right. Once we decide to close the foreign register, once we decide to close the foreign register, what will we do with the entries in the foreign register? We have two options. Whatever entries we have in the foreign register, either we can transfer those entries back to the principal register or in case we have some other foreign register in some other place, we can transfer all the entries to that other foreign register. But when we close the foreign register, within 30 days of closing, we have to inform the ROC that we have discontinued the foreign register. How long are we going to preserve the foreign register? You tell me. How long do you preserve register of members? Permanently. So foreign register of members also, how long will we preserve? Permanently. How long do you preserve register of debenture holders? Eight years, eight years from then, from the date of redemption? Same way, how long will you preserve foreign register of debenture holders for eight years, eight years from the date of redemption. So the same time limit even over here. Three concepts we have covered, register of members, then, in the, uh, then uh, closing the register of members and now foreign registers. All right, come on, let's quickly revise the first three concepts. Some students have joined a little late. Let's quickly revise the first three concepts and then we'll go to the rest of the concepts. 
first concept was register of members it's mandatory every company has to maintain the register of members where uh, what kind of registers have to be maintained a separate register of members a separate register of debenture holders a separate register of each category of security holders then from when when should this register be maintained this register should be maintained from the date of incorporation itself where should it be maintained either at the registered office or in some other place but same city town or village where the registered office is situated or any other place any other city but in india where more than one tenth of the total members reside special resolution has to be passed in case i want to keep the register in any of the places other than my registered office then we learnt when will i make an entry in the register i will make an entry in the register within 7 days from the date on which the board approves my allotment then we learnt that we are supposed to maintain an index tell me out of memory when do you need index you need index only when you have 50 or more than 50 do not make a mistake do not say more than 50 okay 50 or more than 50 at least 50 members i need an index how long will i preserve the register for i'll preserve the register permanently if it is register of members i will preserve the register for 8 years from the date of redemption if it is register of debenture holders then we learned in case the securities are demat securities company will not maintain the uh, register in that case tell me out of memory tell me the name of register register of beneficial owners register of beneficial owners maintained by whom maintained by depository perfect answer guys very good register of beneficial owners maintained by depository that itself will be treated as register for this purpose then we learned in case there are joint shareholders all the joint shareholders name has to enter into the register in what sequence whose name should come first whose name should come second that the shareholders can decide amongst themselves and inform the company by the way i have a question let us say a and b together own 50 shares okay can they tell the company for 20 shares a's name should be first b's name should be second balance 30 shares b's name should be first a's name should be second can they split like this and inform the company yes yes this is allowed this is allowed this is called splitting of shares this is allowed all right then coming to closing the register of members we said at a time we can close the register of members at a time for how many days at a time for 30 days and all throughout the entire year put together we can close for 45 days and before closing how many days notice we have to give the people how when when should we inform the public about it at least 7 days in advance then we spoke about foreign register we said foreign register is not mandatory first of all company if you want you are already having one register in india in addition to this you can open extra extra registers outside india call it foreign registers all right in these foreign registers i will record details about all my shareholders who live outside india in that case scenario the register in india what will i call it i will call it principal register and the register outside india what will i call it the foreign register in case i am opening foreign register same format as the register in india okay when i open the foreign register within how many days i must inform roc guys within 30 days i must inform roc what should i inform roc two things roc i have opened the register i have kept it in new york i have opened the register and where have i kept it i have to inform roc in case i'm changing the situation from one place to another place then even that i have to inform roc within how many days again within 30 days but then whenever we make an entry in the foreign register what do we have to send to registered office what do we have to send to the registered office whenever i make an entry in the foreign register i have to send to the registered office a copy of the entry a copy of the entry don't change the keywords okay i have to i have to send a copy of the entry within how many days within 15 days then we learned in case i am deciding to discontinue the foreign register what to do with the entries two options either i can take those entries and put the entries into the principal register itself or if i have some other foreign register i can transfer the entries into that some other foreign register all right then we learned in case i'm going to discontinue the foreign register i have to inform the roc within 30 days of discontinuation till here all clear foreign register all our time limits are what foreign register all our time limits are 30 days only in one place 
we have 15 days. 15 days is for what? 15 days is for sending copy of entry. Copy of entry, where do we send? We send the copy of entry to the registered office. 100% clarity until you. Yes, come on. Let's go to the next discussion now. Declaration of beneficial interest in shares. Declaration of beneficial interest in shares. Here, what happens is, look at the story here. Red's name is there in the register of members, which means Red is a shareholder of the company. He is a member of the company. His name is there in the register of members. But namesake, actually, who is enjoying the benefits of the shares? Blue. Blue's name is not there in the register of members. Namesake, he has purchased the shares of the company in the name of Red. Everybody thinks Red, Red is a shareholder because Red's name is there in the register of members. But actually, who is enjoying the benefits of the shares? Blue. So, Blue becomes the beneficial owner of the shares. Red becomes the registered owner of the shares. Right. So when I talk about beneficial owner, what happens is his name is actually not there in the register. Nobody even thinks he is the owner of the shares. His name is not even there in the register. He has purchased the shares in the name of somebody else. See, this is not wrong. We are telling red and blue in case a situation like this exists. It is not wrong. Just come and inform the company. Red, even you have to inform the company. Blue, even you have to inform the company. Both have to inform the company within 30 days. Both have to inform the company within 30 days. Then even the company will inform the ROC within 30 days. So in entire beneficial owner concept, how many days do we have? Entire beneficial owner concept, we have 30 days time limit. All right. So come on, let's see this once again. Red. His name is there in the register, but he's actually not enjoying the benefits of the shares. Who is actually enjoying the benefits of the shares? Blue. Blue becomes a beneficial owner. Red becomes a registered owner. What will Red inform the company? Company, listen, my name is there in your register, but actually I am not enjoying the benefits of your shares. It is Mr. Blue. What will Blue inform the company? Company, my name is actually not there in your register of members. Red's name is only there in the register of members, but I am the one who's actually enjoying the benefits of the shares. Red and Blue both will inform the company. See, look at this diagram. Red and Blue both will inform the company. Company will maintain a separate register of beneficial owners and company will inform whom? Company will inform ROC. All the time limits, how many days? All the time limits, 30 days. Red and blue also should inform company within 30 days. Company should also inform ROC within 30 days. Company will also maintain a separate register. But the story is not over here. Two more things we have to learn. Number one, we have to learn what is the definition of beneficial interest. And number two, we have to learn about uh, the dividend rights shares and bonus shares. Let us finish off the easy part first. See, red and blue, they have both informed the company. They have informed the company. Red has told the company Blue is a beneficial owner. Blue has informed the company that I am only the one who's actually enjoying the shares and not Red. Now, this company is declaring bonus shares. This company is declaring dividend. To whom will the company give? To Red or to Blue? To the registered owner or to the beneficial owner? The bonus, the dividend will all go to the registered owner only. Dividends chapter you must have learned. To whom does the company pay dividend? To the registered member of the company, to the registered shareholder of the company. You must have learned the word registered shareholder in dividends chapter. To whom will the company pay dividend? Registered shareholder or his order or his banker you must have learned. Right? So the company, even though Red and Blue have informed the company about this, still company will give bonus, dividend, everything to the registered owner only. All right, one last thing left in this concept. Now, what is beneficial interest? This has a lot of English. We have to learn this up. Beneficial interest includes, beneficial interest includes the right to exercise rights attached to shares, the right to receive dividend, the right to participate in other distributions. What is beneficial interest? Beneficial includes the right to exercise rights, the right to receive dividends, the right to participate in other distributions. Once again, what is beneficial interest? It includes the right to exercise rights. It includes the right to 
receive dividend it also includes the right to participate in other distributions rdd three things all the three keywords should be there in your answer paper exercise rights receive dividends participate in distributions come on tell me one last time what are the three things exercise rights number two receive dividends and number three participate in distributions so three things guys rights dividend distributions all the three keywords should be in your answer paper the right to exercise rights relating to the shares right to receive dividend relating to the shares and right to participate in all other distributions relating to the shares okay so this is it about a beneficial interest discussion crystal clear remember the three time limits for beneficial interest all the three time limits are 30 days Red will also inform company within 30 days. Blue will also inform company within 30 days. See, when you talk about red and blue informing the company, no, use our declaration. Red will file declaration with the company within 30 days. Blue will file declaration with the company within 30 days. And company will inform ROC within 30 days. When company is informing ROC, what word will you use there? Return. Company will file a return with the ROC within 30 days. So, red and blue keyword declaration company keyword return all right see make sure you write the answers with keywords guys see writing in own words is fine but here and there some legal language some technical words have to be there very recently board of studies conducted a webinar wherein they spoke about the last may 2022 examination examiner comments and all about the law paper this is what they said about the law paper they said when we read the students answer paper it looks like they are reading one decom answer paper no in our answer paper we should not be writing just in our own words see we can't write exactly institute uh, study material language word to word nobody is expecting that at least some key words some technical words have to be used all right that's why i keep stressing so much on the keywords now let us go to the next discussion our next section section 90 significant beneficial owner sbo First of all, who is SBO? SBO is an individual. Who is an SBO? SBO is an individual. What kind of an individual? Who has at least 10% of the shares of the company or who has at least 10% voting rights in the company or he has the right to receive at least 10% dividend in the company. These three things either indirectly or directly plus indirectly. Again, who is an SBO? SBO is an individual. He has the right to receive what? At least 10% shares of the company, at least 10% voting rights of the company, at least 10% dividend of the company. He has the right to receive 10%. Remember the 10% number? He holds at least 10% shares of the company or he has at least 10% voting rights in the company or he has the right to receive at least 10% dividend in the company. First three things, either indirectly or directly plus indirectly, or he has the right to exercise significant influence or control over the company directly. Who is SBO? Come on, once again, guys, SBO is first of all an individual. What kind of an individual? An individual who has at least how many percentage shares? What percentage will come to your mind as soon as you see SBO? 10 percentage okay at least 10 percent shares of the company or 10 percent voting rights of the company or the right to receive at least 10 percent dividend in the company first three either indirectly or directly plus indirectly then he also has the right to exercise significant influence or control over the company significant influence or control will be only directly what do you mean by significant influence? Significant influence is the power to participate in the financial and operating policy decisions of the company. What is significant influence? Significant influence is the power to participate in the financial and operating policy decisions of the company. Financial and operating policy decisions of the company. Please remember guys, significant influence is not the power to make the decision. It is a power to participate in the decision making. All right, this keyword here, participate, it is not the power to make the decision. It is a power to participate. Participate in what decision making? Power to participate in the financial and operating policy decision making of the company. Then when we say directly, what do you mean by directly? Directly means either he is owning the shares in his own name or he is having beneficial interest. You remember beneficial interest we just learned? 
either i am a shareholder i own the shares in my own name or i am mr blue who is mr blue actually not owning the shares but enjoying beneficial interest in the shares so either directly means either i am owning the shares in my own name or i have beneficial interest in the shares that is directly indirectly means i am having majority stake in one entity and that entity is having 10% shares 10% voting rights 10% dividend indirectly means what we said indirectly here right what is indirectly indirectly means imagine me one entity and a company okay i am not directly having shares in the company i am not directly having dividend in the company i am not directly having voting rights in the company i have majority stake in one entity this entity has 10% shares 10% voting rights 10% dividend that is indirectly okay so now come on let's look at this once again every word over here now we know sbo is first of all an individual who holds what he holds at least 10% shares of the company or he has a right to receive at least 10% dividend in the company or he enjoys at least 10% voting rights in the company either indirectly or directly plus indirectly what is indirectly tell me indirectly means i have majority stake in the entity and the entity has 10% shares 10% voting rights 10% dividend directly means what directly means in my own name i have 10% shares 10% voting rights 10% dividend either in my own name or in the form of beneficial interest significant influence means what significant influence is a right to make financial and operating policy decisions no it is a right to participate in the financial and operating policy decisions tell me the decisions once again what kind of decisions financial and operating policy decisions financial and operating policy decisions of the company f and o p right to participate okay now if i am a significant beneficial owner i am supposed to inform the company when should i inform the company you have to remember this date 8th february 2019 on 8th february 2019 if i am already sbo then from 8th february 2019 within 90 days i am supposed to inform the company okay if i am already an sbo on 8th february 2019 from 8 february 2019 within 90 days i am supposed to file a declaration and inform the company about this what if i become an sbo after 8 february 2019 after 8 february 2019 if i become an sbo then within 30 days i have to file a declaration and inform the company what should i write in this declaration the nature of my interest and other prescribed particulars the nature of his interest and other prescribed particulars again nature of his interest and other prescribed particulars what is the date that comes to your mind 8th february 2019 on 8th february 2019 if i am already an sbo then from 8th february 2019 within 90 days i have to file a declaration and inform the company what if i become an sbo only after 8th february 2019 then the date on which i become an sbo from that date within 30 days i have to inform the company what will the company do now company will inform the roc company will inform roc within how many days again within 30 days so even in sbo what are the only time limits we're talking about we're talking about only 30 days till now okay guys so one quick revision one quick revision i am very sure some of you would not have understood directly indirectly perfectly uh, is it stuck or something no right okay listen i am very sure many of you would not have understood the directly indirectly part 100% let me give you one quick revision listen carefully who is an sbo first of all sbo is an individual what kind of individual an individual who has at least 10% without seeing at least 10% shares in the company or the right at least 10% voting rights in the company or right to receive at least 10% dividend in the company these three things either indirectly or directly and indirectly and what is num what is the last point the last point in the chart significant influence or control over the company that should be only that should be only directly okay now what is significant influence significant influence is a right to make no 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 right to participate right to participate in what f and op financial and operating policy decisions of the company 
Okay, then we learnt about what do you mean by directly? What do you mean by indirectly? Directly means I am directly having shares in the company. In my name, I purchased shares in the company. In my name, I have voting rights in the company. In my name, I have the right to uh, receive dividend in the company or beneficial interest. Not in my name, in Red's name. I am blue, not in my name, but in Red's name, which means I am a beneficial owner. So either in my own name or as beneficial owner. Okay, that is directly. Now, what is indirectly? Indirectly means I am not directly having shares there. I am having majority stake in an entity and in that entity, and that entity is having 10% shares in the company, 10% voting rights in the company, 10% dividend in the company. Indirectly means through an entity. Okay, then we learned about the time limits we learned. Do you remember the date? Tell me the date. What date did we learn in SDO? We just learned the date. 8th February 2019, right? So on 8th February 2019, I will see, am I already having SB, am I already in SBO on 8th February 2019? Yes, yes, I'm already in SBO. Now what will you do? Within 90 days from 8th February, I am supposed to file a declaration, inform the company about it. And what if I become an SBO after 8th February? Then within how many days? Then within 30 days, I'm supposed to file a declaration and inform uh, the company about it. In this declaration, what should I write? The nature of my interest and other prescribed particulars. Again, nature of his interest and other prescribed particulars. Okay, what will the company do? Company will inform ROC when within 30 days. Then, we, then now listen, company will maintain one separate register. In this register, the company will write all the details about SBO and all. This register is open for inspection also. Who can inspect? Any member can inspect upon payment of 50 rupees fees. For inspection also, we can charge a fee here. 50 rupees fees we can charge during business hours. See, generally for inspection, we don't charge fees. Like minutes and all, inspection, we don't charge fees. But here, SBO register, even for inspection, we are charging a fee. How much fees? Maximum 50 rupees. Who can inspect? Only member can inspect. Then company will file a return of SBO with the ROC. A return company has to file with the ROC, informing ROC who are the SBOs. Now, till now, whatever we learned, we put full responsibility on the SBO. That SBO, you have to inform company within 90 days. You have to inform company within 30 days. Only on that basis, company will maintain register. Only on that basis, company will inform ROC. Company will file return with ROC. Only that register will be open for inspection. Who can inspect? Tell me. I'll give you two options. Members can inspect or SBOs can inspect. What will your answer be? Who can inspect the register of SBOs? Members or SBO? Members. Members can inspect the registers we said. Then we said even for inspection, we can charge a fee fee of maximum 50 rupees. Okay, now listen, we are putting a duty on the company. Company, you don't wait for SBO to come and make a declaration. You also put in the effort. You try to identify people. You try to identify individuals who are SBOs and you ask them to comply with the provisions of the section. You identify people who are SBOs and if they have not filed declaration and all till now, you ask them to comply with the provisions of this section. So to, to identify SBO, company needs information. To get information, company has to give notice to some people and ask them for information. So to whom will the company give notice? Company can give notice to an SBO. Company can give a notice to a person who was an SBO in the last three years. Company can give notice to a person who knows an SBO. Company can give a notice to a person who knows a person who might know an SBO. What is the company doing here? We are putting responsibility on the company. What responsibility? Company, even you put in the effort, even you identify individuals who are SBO. And if they have not fulfilled this section, if they have not given declaration and all, you ask them, you require them to comply with the provisions of the section. So to identify SBO, company needs information. Company will give notice and ask information. To whom will the company give notice and ask information? To people whom the company thinks is an SBO. To people who company thinks was an SBO in the last three years. To people whom the company thinks that they know SBO. They are not SBO. They know an SBO. 
or to a person whom the company thinks that he knows another person who knows an SBO. You're understanding this? To whom will the company give notice and ask information? SBO. Or a person who was an SBO in the last three years? Or a person who knows an SBO? Or a person who knows a person who might know an SBO? These people have to respond to the notice. They have to give the information again within 30 days. In case they don't give information within 30 days, then within the next 15 days, company will go and apply to the tribunal. Company will inform the tribunal. Tribunal will pass an order within 60 days of receiving the company's application. Tribunal will pass an order. If you are not okay with the tribunal's order, you have to file an appeal within one year from the date of the order. Are we clear with this? The last part, the last part I'll repeat once again. In case the company, uh, uh, if you're putting responsibility on the company, company even you put effort to identify SBO and you see if these people have filed declarations or not. If they have not filed declaration, you require them to comply. You require them, you ask them to file the declaration and fulfill this law. To identify SBO, company needs information. To get information, company has to give notice and ask for information. To whom can the company give notice and ask for information? Four people. Tell me the four people, guys. Number one, SBO. Number two, a person who was an SBO when in the last three years. Number three, a person who is himself not SBO, but he knows an SBO. And number four, to a person who knows a person who knows an SBO. Once I get this notice, I have to give the information to the company within how many days, guys? Within 30 days, I have to give information to the company. If I don't give information to the company within 30 days, then the company will file an appeal within 15 days. The, the company will inform a tribunal, not appeal. Company will inform tribunal within 15 days. Tribunal will pass order within 60 days. If I'm not okay with tribunal's order, I can file an appeal when within one year. All right, so we have many time limits here. SBO general time limit is 30 days. When is the time limit? 90 days. If on 8th February 2019 itself I am an SBO, then the time limit is 90 days. Then uh, in case I in case the company sends me a notice, I am supposed to respond to the notice within how much time? Within 30 days. If I don't respond within 30 days, then the company will apply to the NCLT within how many days? 15 days. NCLT will pass an order within how many days? Within 60 days. And if I'm not okay with this order, I can file an appeal against this order within one year. Crystal clear? Hmm? This is it with our entire discussion regarding SBO. So SBO, we said, who is an SBO? He's first of all an individual who has at least 10% shares or has a right or has at least 10% voting rights or has a right to receive at least 10% dividend in the company indirectly or directly and indirectly. Or he has significant influence or control over the company. Significant influence means the right to participate di uh, in uh, financial and operating policy decisions of the company, FNOP. Directly means either in my own name or as beneficial owner. Indirectly means through a company. I have majority stake in a company and that company is having shares, voting rights and dividend in the company. Then we said, if I'm an SBO, I'm supposed to file a declaration and inform the company about it. On 8th February itself, if I'm an SBO, within 90 days, I will inform the company about it. If I become an SBO only after 8th February, then I will inform the company about it within 30 days. Company will file a return. Company will inform the ROC within the next 30 days. Then we learned that uh, in case any shareholder wants to inspect the register, will we allow him to inspect the register of SBOs? Yes, he can inspect the register of SBOs, but for inspection also we can charge a fee from him. Maximum 50 rupees we can charge fee from him. Then we learned company, even you put the effort, even you identify SBOs, even you ask these SBOs to comply with the rules and regulations of the section. To identify SBOs, you need information. To get information, you have to give a notice and ask information. You can give notice to these four people. These four people have to respond within 30 days. If they don't respond within 30 days, within the next 15 days, company will go and file an application to NCLT. NCLT will file an order within 60 days. If I'm not okay with NCLT's order, I will file an appeal within one hour. 100% clarity. Yes. Come on, guys. Let me take you to the next discussion now. Coming to the next discussion, annual return. Annual return, you need to remember the section number, section number 92. Annual return, section number 92. 
content of the annual return we will be learning in full detail. We have totally some 10 contents of the annual return, all right? We will learn it in a particular order. We will use this hint, shrimp MRP CF. Shrimp MRP CF. Again, shrimp MRP CF, okay? Let us see what does each of these letters stand for. S stands for shares, debentures, any other securities and shareholding pattern. S, shares, debentures, securities and shareholding pattern. H, holding company, subsidiary company, associate company, details of that. R, registered office and principal business activities. I was actually indebtedness, but this has been amended. Indebtedness is not there in the annual return anymore. M, members and debenture holders along with changes therein. Then P, who are the promoters, directors, KMP, along with changes therein. Come on, these five things let us learn first. S, shares, debentures, securities and shareholding pattern. H, holding, subsidiary, associate companies. R, registered office and principal business activities. Forget about I. M, members, debenture holders and changes therein. P, promoters, directors, KMP and changes therein. Without seeing S, shares, debentures, securities, and shareholding pattern. H, 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 holding company, subsidiary company, associate company, details of them. Then R, R, registered office and principal business activities. I, forget about I. M, M, members, debenture holders, changes therein. P, P, three people, promoters, directors, KMP, and changes therein. Okay, then coming to the next point, M, meetings of members or class thereof, board meetings, committee meetings. When did we have member meeting? When did we have board meeting? When did we have committee meetings? M is all about meetings. R, remuneration of directors. P, any penalty, any punishment imposed on the company, imposed on directors, imposed on officers. P, any penalty or any punishment put on the company, director, officers. C, whether proper compliance, whether we have properly complied with all the applicable rules and regulations. And F, details with respect to shares held by FII. Who is FII? Foreign Institutional Investor. If any of our shares are held by FII, details about that. So come on, MRP, CF, M, all about meetings. Members meetings, board meetings, committee meetings. R, how much remuneration are we giving to our directors? P, whether any penalty or any punishment. P, two piece, penalty, punishment. Penalty, punishment on whom? On three people, company, officers, directors. C, details about compliance. F, whether any shares are held by FII. Tell me without seeing first point S, shares, debentures, securities and shareholding pattern. Then H, second point H, holding subsidiary associate company, details of that. Then R, registered office and principal business activities. Then forget about I, M, two people, two people, members, debenture holders, changes therein. P, three people, promoters, directors, KMP, changes therein. Right, that was shrimp. Then MRPCF, M stands for what? Meetings, board meetings, committee meetings, shareholder meetings. Then R stands for what? R, how much remuneration are we paying to whom? To a directors. Then P, 2P, penalty, punishment. Three people, which three people? Company, officers, directors. So penalty and punishment imposed on company directors, officers. And uh, C, C, compliance, F, FII. All right. Now, all the 10 points, bottom to top, just the keywords you will tell me, bottom to top. All right, let us see how well we remember. Tell me, last F, just the keyword, FII. Before that, T, no, before that, C, 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 compliance, compliance. Before that, P, penalty, punishment. Then before that, R, remuneration. Before that, M, M, meetings. Then before that, another, before that, P, another P, promoters, directors, KMP. Before that, M, members, debenture holders, changes therein. Then before that, R, registered office and principal business activities. Before that, H, holding subsidiary associate company. In first point, shares, debentures and securities and shareholding pattern. Able to recall the points. Annual return section number. 
section number section number 92 okay now listen annual return don't focus just on the contents there is a lot more to learn in annual return who will sign sign who will sign the annual return depends upon what kind of a company if it's a one person company small company or any private company which is registered as a startup then company secretary has to sign if it is any other company then company secretary and director has to sign which three which three companies specially uh, provided for one person company small company and private companies which are recognized as startup by dipp if i am one person company small company or any private company which is recognized as startup by dipp then company secretary will sign any other company two people will sign company secretary and director which company secretary now if we have company secretary employee that company secretary employee will sign but company secretary employee is not required in every company so we may have companies which don't have company secretary employees in those cases we have to go to a cs in practice and we have to get signature from him then there's one more concept of certification of annual return which is applicable only to some listed companies and other companies with paid up share capital at least 10 crores turnover at least 50 crores if i am a listed company or if i am a company with paid up share capital at least 10 crores turnover at least 50 crores then my annual return has to be certified by cs in practice can i go to the same cs in practice who signed my annual return no the the cs who is signing my annual return and the cs who certifying my annual return they have to be two different people right so who will sign the annual return guys if it's a one person company small company or any private company which is recognized by dipp as startup then just company secretary and what by the way by the way did you notice not every startup i am talking about only those private companies which are recognized as startup private companies which are recognized as startup by whom by dipp who is this dipp department of industrial policy and promotion department of industrial policy and promotion so private company which is recognized as startup by dipp company secretary will sign any other company company secretary and and director should sign then we learned if i am a listed company or if i am any other company with paid up share capital at least 10 crores or turnover at least 50 crores then my annual return also has to be certified by a company secretary in practice but the company secretary who signing the annual return and the company secretary who certifying the annual return they have to be two different people then coming to the most important point under annual return we are supposed to file the annual return with the roc when you can't forget this time limit guys you can't forget this at all within 60 days we are supposed to file the annual return with whom with the roc then within 60 days within 60 days from then within 60 days from the date on which agm is held what if agm is not held then within 60 days from the last date on which agm should have been held all right come on filing of annual return we have to file with whom we have to file with roc then do we have to file we have to file within 60 days within 60 days from when within 60 days from the agm what if agm is not held then within 60 days from the last day on which agm should have been held all right then how long will i keep the annual return copy i will keep a copy of the annual return for 8 years 8 years just like what else where else did we revise 8 years register of debenture holders 8 years from the date of redemption annual return also we will preserve for 8 years now listen in what form will you make this annual return what are the form numbers we are already done learning form mgt1 register of members form mgt2 re register of debenture holders now we are going to be learning the form numbers for annual return this you learn carefully okay because last year only amendment happened here so listen carefully what is the format for annual return generally it is mgt7 okay but sometimes for only one person company and small company only for opc and small company and only for them alone mgt 7a t one person company small company lesser number of details they will have what is the point of even asking them to fill the big annual return so we will give for them an abridged annual return in case they ask you abridged annual return don't wonder which language it is a bridged annual return is nothing but a shorter version a concise version of the annual return applicable only for whom one person company and small company which form number mgt7a 
okay so mgt 7a i will call this as a bridged annual return in the shorter form it's a concise form of the annual return uh, mgt 7a okay so what is one more time limit that we just learned we learned for annual return we are supposed to file the annual return with the roc within 60 days within 60 days from when within 60 days from agm what if agm is not held within 60 days from the last day on which agm should have been held got it guys yes annual return i will preserve for how long annual return preservation is going to happen for eight years all right so annual return hint do you remember hint 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 shrimp mrp cf one small testing what is this m for meetings and this h for holding subsidiary associate p tell me both the p's both the p's penalty punishment penalty punishment on whom three people tell me the three people company directors officers perfect whether anything else happens or not your typing speed is for sure getting better all right so with this we are done with the discussion regarding annual return remember shrimp mrpcf remember 60 days remember who will sign uh, one percent company small company and private companies recognized as startup by dipp company secretary will sign all other companies company secretary and director will sign but the company secretary who certifying the annual return same company secretary can't sign the annual return also certifying and, and and signing have to be two different company secretaries listed companies companies with paid up share capital at least 10 crores companies with turnover at least 50 crores all right so i'll take you to the next discussion now and remember the form numbers form mgt7 generally only for one person company and small companies only for these two form mgt7a what do you call form mgt7a what do you call it abridged annual return just a moment guys All right, taking you forward to the next concept now, inspection of register of members and copy of annual return. Till now we learnt one inspection already, inspection of what register? Inspection of register of SBO, who can register, who, who can inspect? Only members can inspect. For inspection also can we charge a fees? Yes, yes. How much fees? 50 rupees. That's what we learnt. Now I'm talking about inspection of register of members and inspection of annual return. Who can inspect? See, these two things, anybody can inspect. Members, debenture holders, security holders, beneficial owners or any other person, which means anybody can inspect. Then why are we learning like this? Because if members, debenture holders, security holders, beneficial owners, if they are inspecting without any fee, we can let them inspect. But if any other person is inspecting, then for inspection also, we can charge a fee. Maximum how much fee? 50 rupees. When can they inspect? During business hours. Uh, on any working day, they can inspect. Can they ask for copies also? Yes, these people, any person can ask for copy also. But for copy, can we charge a fee? See, soft copy, we don't charge a fee. Hard copy, we can charge a fee. Maximum 10 rupees per page. In case they're asking us for a copy, we have to give them the copy within how many days? Within seven days. Okay, this was simple. Inspection of register of members, copy of annual return. Can I say anybody in the earth can inspect? I can say anybody can inspect the annual return and the registers. But if members, shareholders, debenture holders, even beneficial owners, if they are inspecting free, any other person is inspecting, then I will charge a fee. How much, how much uh, fee we will charge? We will charge a fee of uh, 10, uh 50 rupees for inspection then if they're asking for a copy we will also give them a copy if they're asking us for a soft copy soft copy we have to give free of cost if they're asking us for a hard copy we have to give them the hard copy with a fee of maximum 10 rupees per page if they're asking us a copy we have to give them the copy within seven days 
Okay, guys. Now listen. Coming to an extremely important discussion. Keep your ears and eyes wide open. No background music in your minds. Hundred percent focus. Come on, sit up straight. You cannot get tired already. Sit up straight, guys. Come on, let's do the next part now. The different kinds of businesses which are discussed in the meeting: special business, ordinary business. Special business can be done in any meeting. AGM also, EGM also. But ordinary business can be done only in the AGM. Ordinary business can be done only in the AGM. Special business can be done anywhere in AGM also, in EGM also. Now, what are these ordinary businesses? They have four ordinary businesses. Number one, consideration of three things: financial statements, board report, auditors report. Consideration of three things: financial statement, board report, auditors report. Number two, declaration of dividend. Number three, appointment of directors in the place of those retiring. And number four, appointment and fixing remuneration of auditors. Four ordinary businesses. Number one, consideration. Consideration of what? Financial statement, audit report, board report. Number two, declaration of dividend. Number three, just appointment of directors, no remuneration. Number four, appointing auditors and fixing remuneration. One last time, without seeing what are the ordinary businesses. Number one, the first ordinary business guys. The first one is consideration. Consideration of what? Consideration of financial statements, board report, auditors report. Number two, declaration of dividend. Number three, the third point, appointment of directors. Number four, appointment of auditors and fixing their remuneration. These four are ordinary businesses. Apart from this, everything else is what? Apart from this, everything else will be special business. Where will you do special business? You will do special business only in the special business anywhere, AGM or EGM. Ordinary business where will you do? Ordinary business only in the AGM. So, can I put a flow chart like this? That in the AGM, I can do ordinary business also. Special business also, but in EGM I can do only special business. Do you agree? Yes, because ordinary business can be done only in the EGM. Same thing. One more way I can write: ordinary business I can do only in EGM. Special business where I can conduct in EGM also. In EGM also. All right. So in the AGM, I can discuss ordinary business and special business. In EGM, I can discuss only special business. Apart from these four ordinary businesses, everything else will be what? Everything else will be special business. All right. So this was it about our discussion until here. Until here, many concepts we've learned. We've we've revised about uh, registers. We've revised about foreign registers. Closing the register. Closing the register. Tell me at a time. How many days at a time? 30 days and in a year put together 45 days and before closing how many days in advance i have to inform 7 days beneficial interest definition tell me the three keywords beneficial interest definition keywords tell me the keywords not the hint rdd everybody knows tell me the three keywords r right to exercise rights okay d d d, d dividend and last t distribution perfect so then we learned about significant beneficial owners. We learned about annual return. We learned about inspection. We learned anybody can inspect. If members and all are inspecting, we won't charge a fee. Others are inspecting. 50 rupees fee we will charge from them. Then we learned about ordinary business and special business. Now let us go to our next discussion. We're going to be learning about notice of the meeting. Important concept. Listen. Notice of the general meetings, section 101. I am going to give a notice. First of all, to whom will I give the notice? I can give the notice to members of the company. Uh, I, I have to give the notice to the members of the company, to the legal representative in case a member has died. Uh, in case a member has become insolvent, I will give it to the assignee. I also have to give the notice to the auditor and to the directors. Totally to three people, to the members of the company. If, if the member dies, legal representative. If a member becomes insolvent, to his official assignee. And number two, I also have to give to the auditors of the company. Number three, I also have to give it to the directors of the company. Okay, so these are the three people to whom I will give the notice. Who will give the notice? Proper authority. Who is this proper authority? Board of directors. What if some other person, what if company secretary is giving notice? What will you do? In that case, meeting will become invalid. But please, please, please make the meeting valid. What will you do? Okay, fine. What's the shortcut? 
it has to be ratified 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 means what it has to be approved approved by whom approved by proper authority approved when before the meeting so who has to give the notice proper authority what if somebody else gives the notice meeting will become invalid but no i want to let the meeting be valid what will you say okay go to the proper authority get ratification from them before the meeting can be held then this notice has to be given to whom to members member died legal representative member became insolvent official receiver official assignee number 2 auditor number 3 directors should we send the notice to every shareholder preference shareholder and all not required but last two years continuously if i don't pay them any dividend then even they can vote in every resolution of the company just like shareholders so in that case even to preference shareholders i can give the notice okay what if the company does not give notice to one particular shareholder company gave to everybody else just to this one shareholder alone, alone company did not give in that case we will see is it accidental omission or is it deliberate omission wantedly company did not give or by mistake company did not give if wantedly company did not give then the meeting itself will become invalid but no no by mistake accidentally company did not give then the meeting will stay valid but who will have to prove on whom will we put the burden of proof on whom will we put the onus of proof who will have to prove it was accidental please let the meeting be valid the burden of proof the onus of proof is on the company company will have to prove then if the company says i did not give notice to this particular shareholder because i did not even know he is a shareholder of the company company did not give me notice okay company is giving a justification we did not give a notice to anushri because we did not even know she is a shareholder first of all deliberate omission or accidental omission deliberate omission company how can you not know who your shareholders are deliberate omission then number 2 company did not send me the notice because i am living in the northeast even if the company sends me notice there are chances that the notice will anyways get lost it will not reach me that is why company did not send me the notice deliberate omission or accidental omission even this is deliberate omission company you cannot make a decision whether it's going to reach that person or not what is your responsibility you have to send the notice to every shareholder even if you think the notice will not reach the shareholder you still have to send it and how can you not know who your shareholders are of course you will know who your shareholders are you have to give a notice to all the shareholders okay so point number 1 what if the company uh, to uh, who will give the notice notice will be given by proper authority who is this proper authority board of directors what if any other person gives the notice then the meeting will become invalid uh, but is there some way can we still make the meeting valid yes yes there is one way you go to the proper authority you get ratification before the meeting to whom should we send the notice to three people number 1 to members but what if member dies legal representative but what if member becomes insolvent official receiver official assignee number 2 who else auditor number 3 who else director <laughs> then number 4 should we give the notice to all the shareholders to preference shareholders also not required but last two years continuously if i did not pay preference dividend now even preference shareholders will get to get the right to vote on every resolution just like equity shareholders so in that case even to preference shareholders i have to give the i have to give the notice otherwise generally preference shareholders not required then we learn what if the company by mistake forgets to give a notice by mistake it's okay meeting will be valid but wantedly if the company does not give the notice then the meeting itself will become invalid deliberate omission meeting will become invalid we saw two examples of deliberate omission where number one company did not give the notice to me because company did not even know i am a shareholder deliberate omission company how can you not know who is not your shareholder who is your shareholder how can you not know second example we saw company did not give notice to me because company thought it will anyways not reach me company you can't make all these decisions your responsibility is you have to send the notice to all the shareholders in case they are joint shareholders will the company send to all the joint shareholders the notice no only to the joint shareholder whose name appears first the senior most joint shareholder the joint shareholder whose name appears first we will give the notice only to that joint shareholder okay then listen to my next point the next concept when should the notice be sent 
leave the date of meeting, leave the date of service of notice in between 21 clear days. Again, leave the date of meeting, leave the date of service of notice in between clear 21 days. Do not say sending the notice. What word will we use? Date of service of notice. Okay, so leave the date of notice, leave the date of meeting in between 21 clear days. In case of the section 8 company, 21 days not required, 14 days itself enough. In case the meet notice is sent by post, then we will assume that the notice was served within 48 hours after it was posted. Okay, so if, the, if it is sent by post, we will assume it got uh, served within 48 hours from sending the post. Now listen, listen to this example. We have sent the notice. We have sent the notice. Let us say we have posted the notice on 16th August. Okay, and the meeting is going to be held when meeting is going to be held on 7th September. Is the notice valid or not? How will you check? What you do is you first find the gap between these two days. What is the gap between 16th August and 7th September? Tell me. In August, how many days? August 31 minus 16 plus 1. That's going to be how many days? That's going to be 31 minus 16. No, don't, don't add a 1. 31 minus 16 is going to be 15 days. In September, how many days? 7 days. Totally how many days? 22 days. But I want you to tell me the gap between these two days in such a way that I want you to include both the days. Including both the days, how much gap? What will you do? Including both the days, you will add one. It will become 23 days. Then, is, is, is 23 days enough for us? Is it a valid notice now? We have sent with 23 days gap. Is it a valid notice? No. How to identify that? See, what is a gap? 23 days. I will subtract one day date of meeting. I will subtract one day date of service of notice. It was sent by post, which means I will subtract 48 hours more. 48 hours more means how many days? I will subtract two days. This is how many days now? This is going to be only 19 days. This number should be at least 21 days. Only then it is valid. All right. This is the easiest way in which you can handle this. You will see when was the notice. I, I'll, I'll re-explain. Listen, I will see when was the notice posted. When was the meeting going to be held? So in between these two days, what is the gap? In August, total 31 days, minus 16, 15 days. In September, 7 days. So total 22 days. But do you agree this 22 days includes only one out of these two? 22 will include any one out of these two days. Like for example, if I say September 1 to September 3, in between how many days, what will you say? Two days, right? So when you say two days, either September 1 you are counting or September 3 you are counting. You are not counting both. But because if you count both, then it will be how many days? Then it will be three days. Same logic. So 16th August, 7th September gap, if I'm asking you to calculate, you're calculating 22 days. This 22 days will either include 16th August or it will include 7th September. It will not include both. I want you to tell me including both. So to include both, I will add one. So it becomes 23 days. Now, from this 23 days, I will subtract two days for post. I will subtract two days, date of service, date of meeting. In between balance, it should be 21 days. Balance, I have only 19 days, not 21 days. Hence, what will our answer be? Meeting invalid. All right. See, I'm asking between September 1 and 3, what is the gap? Both days included, I'm asking. Understanding. Who is this student? Name is Delna. September 1, September 3. In between, I'm, I'm asking how many days, both days included, how many days I'm asking? Both days included, what will you say? 1, 2, 3. 3 days. How did you get 3 days? 3 minus 1, 2 plus 1. Same logic. So 16th August, 7th September, both days included, how many days I'm asking you? August 15, September 7, total 22. Right? Total 22. Then I want to include both the days. So I will add one. So 23. Understood, Delna? 
all right so this is it about our discussion regarding the notice part now going back to my uh, story of notice what if i send a shorter notice what if i send a notice less than 21 days gap then what will happen if it is less than 21 days we will see is it an agm or is it any other meeting if it is agm then if you are able to get consent of 95 percent of the members who have the right to vote even though shorter notice it's okay if it is any other meeting then we need consent of majority of members and they must also be holding 95 percent shares okay so can i send a notice with less than 21 days gap also in that case meeting will become invalid but there is a shortcut you can keep the meeting still valid if it is agm get consent of at least 95% of the members who have the right to vote any other meeting get consent of majority of members and put together they must be holding at least 95% shares in the company how to send the notice guys we have many options we can either send it personally by hand or we can send it through speed post registered post or courier or we can send it electronically if we are sending it by email our job is over as soon as we click the send button after clicking the send button whether you receive it whether you don't receive it you received it but it is gone and it, it has gone into your spam folder for all that can you blame the company no the company's job is over when it clicks the send button any problem during transmission company cannot be held responsible okay so how will you send the notice you will send the notice either personally by hand or through post or electronically when you're sending electronically your responsibility will be over once you click the send button once a company clicks the send button even if it doesn't reach the shareholder it is not the company's fault then we learned now listen guys this point we're going in detail if you're going to send through speed post registered post through courier that is if you're going to send the notice by postal services to which address will we send to the registered address this registered address of the members can it be outside india no it should be an address in india but what if the member has given a foreign address then what will we ask him we will ask him no no you give some address in india what if he's still not giving any address in india do we have to send him a notice outside india no if he's still not giving an address in india we will simply give advertisement in newspaper we will simply give advertisement in one newspaper which is circulating in the place where registered office is situated that itself will be considered as if notice has been given to that member sometimes member might tell the company send the notice to me only by a specific mode send the notice to me only by speed post and for that he may give some money also to the company in that case company should serve the notice in that mode only otherwise what if the company sends a notice in some other mode then it will be as if invalid notice as if the notice was not served duly all right till here can we revise can we revise till here and un, uh, until here whatever concepts we've learned come on guys let us go from the beginning of the notice discussion with section section 101 notice has to be given by whom notice has to be given by proper authority who is this proper authority proper authority is board of directors what if notice is given by any other person meeting will become invalid but no no you can keep the meeting still valid if it is ratified by the proper authority on or before the date of the meeting to whom will we give the notice to the shareholders if they die legal representative if they became insolvent official assignee then who else do we have to give the notice to directors and auditors then we learned what if we don't give a notice to a person by mistake if it is accidental omission no problem meeting will be valid but if it is deliberate omission meeting will become invalid should we give to preference shareholders also preference shareholders generally not required but last two years continuously if you did not pay any dividend to them and then even they will get the right to vote on every resolution just like equity shareholders so in that case yes you have to give the notice to them also then we started learning in case a joint shareholders to whom will we give the notice to the shareholder whose name is appearing first then we learned that uh, how many days notice do we have to give 21 clear days notice leave the date of service of notice leave the date of meeting in between 21 clear days gap we need okay in case we're sending it by post we will add another 48 hours in case it's a section it company then 14 clear days is enough all right i taught you how to check the time gap including the date of service including the date of meeting in between you see how many days okay then to that from that you subtract two days for post you subtract two days for date of service and date of meeting in between minimum the balance number should be at least 21 days 
then we learned what if I send a shorter notice, then we said if it's an AGM, it will still be valid if 95% of the members who have the right to vote approve. But if it is any other meeting, then who should approve, guys? Majority of members holding at least 95% of the shares. Majority of members holding at least 95% of the shares should approve. How will we send the notice? We said either we can send it personally or through post or through email. If you are sending through email, company's role is over once a company sends the notice. After sending, during transmission, something happens, company is not responsible. Then we learned if the company is sending by post, then the company will send it to the registered address of the member. If the member is not giving any, if the member's registered address is outside India, we will request the member, member, please give some address in India. If he's still not giving address in India, we don't have to send the address to, we don't have to send the notice to foreign address. If he is not giving some address in India, then we will simply give the notice as one advertisement in one newspaper, which is circulating in the place where registered office is situated, that itself will be deemed to be notice given. Then we learned in case a shareholder is insisting, please send the notice to me only by speed post. Here for this, you keep 1000 rupees deposit money. In that case, company should send him only by speed post. In such a case, if the company sends him the notice by any other mode, it will be an invalid notice as if the company did not give the notice properly. Then coming to the next point, what will I write in this notice? I will write the place, date, time, place, when, where is the meeting going to be held and what are we going to discuss in the meeting, the agenda. But we don't use the word agenda, we use the word statement of business. Okay, so place, date, date, time of the meeting and statement of business, that is agenda. What are the matters which are going to be discussing in the meeting, statement of business. And then we learn in, in this notice, we also have to put an explanatory statement. In this, this explanatory statement is only required if we have special business in the meeting. If you are going to discuss special business, remember we just learned special business, ordinary business, two kinds of businesses we just learned. Ordinary business explanatory statement not required. Explanatory statement required only if it is a special business. In this explanatory statement, what will we write? We will write about the nature of concern and interest. That is, in that special business, if our director, manager, KMP, relatives, four people, guys, director, manager, KMP, relatives, if they have any interest, if they have any connection with the special business, details of that we have to disclose. Then number two, any other matter which will help the members to make a decision on the matter. Number three, if the special business is connected to some other company, okay, and in that company, our promoters, directors, manager, KMP are having at least 2% of paid up share capital, then that also we have to disclose in the explanatory statement. And lastly, if the special business is connected to some document, then where is this document kept? When and where can you inspect this document? Details about that has to be written. Explanatory statement contents. I am very particular about this. We have to learn this up properly. Come on, guys. What are the contents of the notice? What do I write in the note? What do I write in the notice? Number one, place, date, day, time, and agenda. Instead of agenda, statement of business. Place, date, day, time, and statement of business. Number two, explanatory statement. In this explanatory statement, uh, why do we need explanatory statement? Only if it is a special business. Ordinary business, I don't need explanatory statement. In this explanatory statement, how many things we will write? Four things. Number one, nature of concern or interest. Number one, nature of concern or interest. Who is concerned? Who is interest? Four people. Director, manager, KMP and relatives. Number two, third point. Third point come first. Number two. If this special business is having connection with some other company, in that company, if our directors, manager, KMP, who is extra person, director, manager, KMP or promoter, if they are together having at least 2% shares of that company, that has to be disclosed. Number three, any other matter which will help the members make a decision. Number four, if the special business relates to a document, then where is this document kept? When and where can this document be inspected? These are the contents of the explanatory statement. Guys, come on. The participation has become very, very less. Sit up straight. You cannot be tired already. We have a long way to go. Come on, guys. What are we learning? Contents of the explanatory statement. Tell me without seeing. Number one, nature of concern or interest. Nature of concern or interest. Whose concern or interest? Three, uh, four people. Directors, managers, KMB and their relatives. Number two. If the matter is relating to some other company and in that company, 
four people are having how much interest, how much shareholding? At least 2% shareholding. Who are the four people? Same director, manager, KMP, but instead of relatives, who is the extra person? Promoter. Number three, the third point, in any other matter which will help the shareholders make a decision. And the last point, the fourth point, if the matter relates to a document, when and where this document can be inspected. Harrow with the notice discussion. Yes, guys, what was the last part of notice? The last part of the notice was how will we send the notice and what if the shareholder insists send me the notice only by one specific mode? In that case, we should send him only by that specific mode. Otherwise, as if notice is not properly served. What if the shareholder is giving some other foreign address as registered address? You're supposed to send him the notice to his registered address. But if his registered address is foreign address, then we will request him, please give some address in India. If he's not giving address in India, we will simply give this uh, notice as an advertisement in one newspaper having wide circulation in the place where registered office is situated. 21 clear days, section 8 company 14 days and 48 hours in case I send it by post. Proper authority can be ratified if, said, if given by improper authority. Can I close the notice discussion? Can we come to the quorum discussion, guys? Come on, listen. Now. Quorum, first of all, what exactly is quorum? Quorum is nothing but the minimum number of members who must be present at the meeting. Only if that minimum number of uh, members is present in the meeting, only then I can start the meeting. Otherwise, meeting is invalid. I can start the meeting only if that minimum number of members come to the meeting. Then what if there is no quorum? How long will I wait for the quorum? I will wait only for half an hour. What if in that half an hour, that minimum number of members does not come? Then we will see what kind of a meeting is it. We will see, is it, a, uh, is it a meeting which was normal meeting called by board of directors or is it a meeting called by requisitionists? EGM, you must have learned about requisitionists. So you will see, was it a meeting called by requisitionists or is it any other meeting called by board of directors as usual? If it is any other meeting called by board of directors as usual and if there is no quorum within half an hour, the meeting will automatically get adjourned to same day, same time, same place in the next week or some other date time place which who will decide board will decide even for this adjourned meeting do we have to give a notice guys yes even for this adjourned meeting we have to give a notice how many days notice three days notice but don't you think three days notice will become very very difficult for the company so that is why we give mm. one more option to the company company listen if three days notice is not possible to give to each member individually you do one thing three days before the meeting you give an advertisement in newspapers. One English newspaper, one vernacular newspaper having wide circulation in the place the registered office is situated. Okay, then what if in the adjourned meeting also no quorum? In the adjourned meeting also there's no quorum, it's okay. How many ever members are there? That itself is quorum, you continue with the meeting. Then, should co is it enough that quorum is there initially or should quorum be there before every business, before every matter of discussion? Quorum should not only be there in the beginning, quorum should be there before every matter of discussion. See, in the beginning, we need quorum because only if there is quorum, we can start the meeting. But not only should quorum be there in the beginning, even before every matter is being discussed, even before every matter, there should be quorum. Before any particular matter, if there is no quorum, then that matter's discussion itself will become invalid. Right? Then what is the quorum number? What is the quorum number? Depends upon what kind of a company, private company or public company. Private company, life is easy. If it's a private company, quorum is two. But if it is a public company, depends upon the number of members. If it has up to 1000 members, quorum is five. If it has more than 1000 members, but up to 5000 members, quorum is 15. If it has more than 5000 members, quorum is 30. Five, 15, 30. Five, 15, 30. Can the AOA say, no, 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 in this company, 100 is the quorum. Can the AOA prescribe a higher quorum? Yes, it is allowed. AOA can prescribe a higher quorum. Till here, can we revise the quorum discussion, guys? Come on, come on, come on, come on. What is quorum? Quorum is a minimum number of members that must be present. Only then I can start the meeting. Only then I can transact business at the meeting. I can start the meeting only when there is quorum. How long will I wait for the quorum? I will wait for only half an hour. Within this half an hour, quorum should be there. Within half an hour, quorum is not there. Then we will see what kind of a meeting is it. Was it a meeting called by requisitionists? Uh, Vijay was asking what are who are requisitionists? Requisitionists are uh, something which you will be learning in EGM. 
So right now I'm not going into that EGM discussion. We will anyways discuss. Okay. So if the meeting is being called by requisitionists and in that meeting, if there's no quorum, no question of adjourning and all, meeting will get cancelled. But then if it is any other normal general meeting, then the meeting will get adjourned, adjourned to when same day, same time, same place in the next week or some other date, time, place, which who will decide, board will decide. Even for this adjourned meeting, is notice required? Yes, yes. How many days notice? At least three days notice is required. Three days notice sent to each member individually or if not possible, simply give as an advertisement in two newspapers, one English, one vernacular newspaper, having wide circulation in the place where registered office is situated. Then we learned there was no quorum. So we adjourned the meeting. What if in this adjourned meeting also no quorum? No problem. Don't adjourn again. In the adjourned meeting also there is no quorum. Then how many ever members are present? You assume that itself is quorum and you go ahead with the meeting. But guys, listen. Earlier meeting, the first meeting was adjourned not because of quorum. It was adjourned because of some other purpose. It was getting mm -hmm. late. Shareholders wanted to leave. That is why we adjourned the meeting. Now in this adjourned meeting, do I need quorum? Yes. If the earlier meeting was adjourned because there was no quorum, then in the adjourned meeting, even though no quorum, no problem. But the first meeting was adjourned because of some other reason. Then adjourned meeting also, we need quorum. In this adjourned meeting, if there is no quorum, then, then again adjourn. Then again, the meeting will be get adjourned. Same day, same time, same place next week. In that adjourned meeting, if there is no quorum, no problem. How many ever members are present? That itself is quorum. You continue with the meeting. Understood? Everybody? Yes. So this was about the uh, adjournment. Then how many member, how many core, how much, uh, what is the quorum? What is the quorum depends upon what kind of a company, private company, public company. If it is a private company, two. If it is a public company, then depends upon the number of members. Up to 1,000 members, five is a quorum. More than 1,000, but up to 5,000, 15 is a quorum. More than 5,000, 30 is a quorum. 5, 15, 30. In quorum, will we count proxies also? No. In quorum, we will not count proxy. Our shareholder is president of our country. He did not come. He sent representative. Will I count representative of president? Yes. Representative of president and governor, when they come for the meeting, it is as if the president and governor have themselves come. Our shareholder is company. Can company come and attend my meeting? No. Company will obviously send representative. Company's representative will I count? Yes. Remember guys, if company's representative comes or if president governor's representative comes, what will you treat? Will you count them as proxies? Will you treat them as proxies? No. If the president's representative comes, if the governor's representative comes, if a company's representative comes, you will treat as if the shareholder has himself come. I have a question. What if I am representing five companies in a particular meeting. There's a particular meeting of shareholders, okay? Five companies are shareholders of this company. Now, all the five companies have appointed me as representative. So I am going and attending the meeting. Question number one, will you count me also in the quorum? Yes. Then the representative is attending. You will treat as if shareholder himself has come. But you will count me as one or you will count me as five? I am representing five companies. You will count me as five people. All right, guys. Proxies will not be counted, but representatives of president, representative of governor, representative of company will be counted. Then we have some exceptional cases where only one member is present. Even that itself is quorum. There are some exceptional cases where just one member is there. Even that itself is quorum. For example, number one, if it's a meeting of a particular class of shareholders, let us say it is a meeting of just preference shareholders. It is possible all the preference shareholders are held by only one person. So in that preference shareholders meeting, only one person will come allowed. Then number two, sometimes the company is holding the meeting because NCIT is ordering the company to hold the meeting. When the NCLT orders the company to hold the meeting, NCLT can give any instruction. In such cases, NCLT can also give an instruction that just one member present, that itself is enough, start the meeting. So when is one single member also enough? Number one, when all the shares of that particular class are held by only one person. And number two, 
NCLT is asking the company to hold the meeting. NCLT is giving directions. NCLT can give any directions. NCLT can even give a direction that only one member is present. That itself is enough. Continue with the meeting. <clears throat> Understood, guys? Yes. And then coming to one last point. When does quorum become immaterial? When does quorum become immaterial? If the quorum is more than number of members of the company and all the members are present. Let us take one example. There are totally 2,000 members in a public company. What is the quorum as per the act? Tell me. Quorum as per the act will be 15 right but can the aoa say no no in this company 50 is required can the aoa say like that yes so which means not 15 i will treat it as 50 okay so quorum is 50 but there was some calamity something happened because of which a lot of members died and all total number of shareholders in the company is only 20 let us say and all the 20 have come to the meeting is it possible for quorum to come is it possible for us to have 50? No, because the number of members is reduced to 20. So if the number of members is below quorum, if number of members is below quorum and all the members have come, I don't have to consider about quorum. You understood? If the total number of members is below 50, if the total number of members is below quorum and all the members have come, I can ignore quorum. Okay, then if they are joint shareholders, how will you count them? Three joint shareholders, all the three have come for the meeting. Will you count them as three or will you count them as one? You will count them as three. How many ever joint shareholders have come? You will count them separately. You will count them as many as they have come. Got it, guys? So this is it about our entire discussion regarding quorum. Quorum is nothing but the minimum number of members who must be present in the meeting. Only then I can start the meeting. Quorum should not only be present when I start the meeting. Quorum should also be present before every matter. Quorum should be present within half an hour. Otherwise, I will see what kind of a meeting is it. I will see who called the meeting. Did the board of directors call the meeting or did the requisitionists call the meeting? Requisitionists, they themselves called the meeting. In that meeting itself, there is no quorum. What will happen to the meeting? Ajahn, no. Meeting will get cancelled. But what if any other normal meeting called by board? In that case, may no quorum, no problem. Meeting will get adjourned to same day, same time, same place next week or some other date, time, place decided by board of directors. For this adjourned meeting also, do I have to give a notice? Yes. How many days notice? Generally 21 days. Section 8 company 14 days. But for this adjourned meeting, only 3 days notice. If it is not possible to give individually to one one person, no problem. You give it as an advertisement in one English newspaper, one vernacular newspaper having wide circulation in the place where registered office is situated. Now, what if in this adjourned meeting also no quorum? Then hopeless only. Adjourned meeting also no quorum then. How many ever members are there? That itself you continue. You assume that itself is quorum. But this we learned, this will apply only if earlier meeting was adjourned because of lack of quorum. Only then you can say like this, what if the earlier meeting was adjourned because of some other reason, then adjourned meeting also we want quorum. Okay, then we learned that quorum private company too, that's all, public company up to 1000 members 5, more than 1000 up to 5000 15, more than 5000 30. When we are counting quorum, will we count proxies also? No. Will we count representative of companies? Yes. Will we count representative of president and governor? Yes. Then we spoke about single member quorum. Then we learned when will quorum become immaterial. We said the total number of members in the company is below quorum. Okay. And all the members have come for the meeting. Then quorum will become irrelevant. Lastly, joint shareholders. How many ever they are? How many ever have come? You will count them all separately. Thorough guys with this discussion also. Yes. We'll go to the next discussion now. Chairman of the meeting. This is simple. Who is the chairman? Generally, the AOA will mention who the chairman is. But in case the AOA is silent or AOA is mentioning, okay, gen see generally what does the AOA mention? Generally, AOA mentions that the chairman of the board of directors, that person itself will become chairman of the general meeting also. What does the AOA mention most of the times? Whoever is the chairman of the board of directors, he itself will become chairman of the meeting also. But in case AOA is silent or AOA is saying chairman of board will be chairman of meetings, but board doesn't have a chairman. Or board has a chairman, 
but he did not come how long we will wait for him we will wait for only 15 minutes he does not come within 15 minutes or he is coming within 15 minutes but he is not willing to act in that case we'll have to appoint a new chairman how will we choose the chairman we will choose him by show of hands but in case we the shareholders in case the proxies are demanding for a poll we have to take up the poll immediately to conduct the poll we need a chairperson to conduct the poll who will conduct the poll who which chairperson will conduct the poll by show of hands we appointed a chairperson that chairperson only will conduct the poll through the poll let us say we appointed this person uh, blue as the chairperson so for the rest of the meeting who will be the chairperson blue okay so chairman of the meeting generally what is the aoac come on guys generally what is the aoac generally the aoac says that whoever is the chairman of the board of directors that person itself will be the chairman of the meeting also but sometimes aoa is silent or sometimes aoa is mentioning that chairman of board will be chairman of meeting but board doesn't have a chairman or board has a chairman but we waited for 15 minutes he did not come or he came within 15 minutes but he saying today i don't want to be the chairman of the meeting in that case we need to appoint a chairman how will we appoint the chairman guys we will appoint him by show of hands but in case the shareholders are demanding for a poll then when will we take up the poll we will take up the poll immediately but to conduct the poll we need a chairperson who will be the chairperson the chairperson who was appointed by show of hands he only will conduct the poll as a result of the poll let us say blue was appointed for the rest of the meeting who will be the chairperson blue understood guys everybody is thorough with this discussion also hmm? now can a proxy be appointed as a chairperson no a proxy cannot be appointed as a chairperson what are the powers of the chairperson five powers okay and how will you remember the five powers md mdc five powers of the chairperson md mdc number 1 he manages the meeting number 2 he maintains decorum in the meeting number 3 he executes minutes that is he signs the minutes number 4 he decides what matter will be taken up in the meeting what matter will not be taken up in the meeting and number 5 he has casting vote tell me when does he have casting vote he has casting vote only if two conditions are fulfilled condition number 1 aoa should authorize condition 2 we are passing an ordinary resolution and the number of votes in favor is equal to number of votes against that is there is a tie so to break the tie we will give the chairperson one extra vote which is called the casting vote so if he votes yes then resolution pass if he votes no then resolution gone all right so this is it about our discussion regarding the chairperson guys remember the five powers md mdc now m stands for meetings uh, he manages the meetings d stands for he maintain decorum in the meeting then number 3 he executes minutes of the meeting number 4 he is the one who decides what are the questions which will be taken up in the meeting and number 5 he gets a casting vote when does he get the casting vote he gets a casting vote only if the aoa allows and in case we are trying to pass an ordinary resolution and the number of votes in favor is equal to the number of votes against that is there is a tie to break the tie we give an extra vote to the chairman but will the chairman automatically have this casting vote no he will have this uh, casting vote only if aoa clearly mentions yes only in the case of ordinary resolution not in the case of special resolution all right guys uh, so and, and also remember first we will appoint the chairperson by show of hands only if the shareholders and proxies are demanding for a poll only then we will take up the poll to conduct the poll we need a chairperson who will be the chairperson to conduct the poll the chairperson who was appointed by show of hands red but because of poll let us say blue is appointed rest of the meeting who will be the chairperson blue okay then uh, guys tell me the keywords of the powers one last time m stands for first m he manages the meeting right he manages the meeting then d d he maintains decorum then the next m he executes minutes then the next d the fourth d he makes a decision that what matters have to be taken up and all and c this is the last point casting vote casting vote he will have only if the aoa specifically mentions and we are trying to pass an ordinary resolution and in the ordinary resolution we are facing a tie that is when we will give him casting vote okay come on guys let us go to the next discussion now proxies proxy who exactly is a proxy who can appoint a proxy 
we'll see all the points. Only a person who is a member of the company, condition one, and he has a right to attend the meeting and he has a right to vote at the meeting. Three points, three conditions. A member who has the right to attend and vote at the meeting. Again, a member who has the right to attend and vote at the meeting, only he can appoint a proxy. Can many people appoint the same person as proxy? Maximum 50 people can appoint the same person as proxy and all their shares put together should not exceed 10% of the total voting power. Can many people appoint the same person as proxy? Maximum how many can appoint? Maximum 50 can appoint and all of them put together cannot have more than 10% of the voting power. But I am proxy only of one person. That one person has 15% shares. Can I be proxy? Yes, if I am proxy only of one person, then how many ever shares he holds, no problem. When does this provision apply? This provision applies only when I am a proxy of many shareholders. All of them put together, not more than 10% voting power. Okay, now can a proxy demand a poll? Yes. Can a proxy vote on a poll? Yes. But can a proxy vote in show of hands? No. Can proxy speak at the meeting? No. Can we count the proxy in the quorum? No. Can he attend the meeting? Yes. Can he attend the meeting? Yes. Can he vote? In poll? Yes. In show of hands? No. Can he demand a poll? Yes. Can he speak at the meeting? Yes. Uh, can he speak at the meeting? No. Can he be counted in the quorum? No. Alright. In the notice, it should be clearly be written that shareholders, if you want, you can appoint proxies. Proxy need not necessarily be a member. But in which company proxy has to be a member? Generally, proxy may be a member, may not be a member. But in which companies proxy has to be a member? In Section 8 companies. In Section 8 companies, it is mandatory that proxy has to be a member. Okay, so generally, proxies may be a member or not. But in Section 8 companies only, it is mandatory that proxy has to be a member. Okay, now listen, the uh, instrument appointing proxy, the form appointing proxy, we have to deposit with the company when at least 48 hours before the meeting. In case I want to inspect the proxy form, I have to inform the company how many days in advance? Three days in advance, I have to inform the company. And when will I be able to inspect the proxy form? I can inspect this prox proxy form in 24 hours before the meeting. All right. After appointing a proxy, can I cancel his appointment? Yes. Between shareholder and proxy, what kind of relationship is existing? Principal agent relationship only is existing between shareholder and proxy. So uh, once the shareholder appoints a proxy, shareholder can revoke his appointment. How? Before the proxy can vote, shareholder can go and vote. Once shareholder votes before proxy votes, now even, even proxy can get voting, right? Obviously not. The shareholder, once he appoints a proxy, he can revoke the proxy. How? By simply going and voting before the proxy can vote. Even before the proxy can vote, he can simply go and vote. One more way of revocation, the, let us say red has already appointed blue as proxy. If, if he appoints one more person as proxy green, automatically what happens? Blue's appointment get, gets revoked. So red can appoint another person as proxy that will automatically revoke the first person's appointment. Okay, but then, but then listen, uh, when are we supposed to submit the instrument appointing proxy with the company? At least 48 hours before the meeting. What if Green's instrument was appointed only 3-4 hours before the meeting then? Then also will revocation happen? No. Then revocation will not happen because in that case Green's appointment will be invalid. Green's appointment will be invalid and Blue's appointment will continue. Okay, so in case we want to revoke the proxy, can we revoke the proxy? Yes, yes, we can. How to revoke? We can revoke, we have two methods. Number one, we can revoke by uh, voting even before the uh, proxy can vote. Or number two, we can appoint one more proxy. But if we want to appoint one more proxy, the second proxy we have to appoint within at least 48 hours before the meeting. Okay, only then we can uh, revoke the first proxy. I already appointed blue as a proxy. Then I'm appointing green as a proxy. Green's proxy form also I should submit to the company at least 48 hours before the meeting. If I do that, then blue's appointment will automatically get revoked. Green only will be the proxy. But if I submit green's proxy form after 48 hours, that is during the 48 hours, then green's appointment will be invalid. Blue's appointment will still continue.
then in case we have three joint shareholders joint shareholders preferably they should come to a common conclusion and they should appoint only one person as proxy but no they are not able to come to a common conclusion they are all appointing one one person in that case whose proxy will we give priority we will give the senior most shareholders proxy only priority but you know who attended the meeting purple blue and green these three people attended the meeting now whom will you give priority obviously purple if one of the joint shareholders is attending we will obviously give priority to them so joint shareholders preferable that you come to a common conclusion and you appoint only one person as proxy but in case you are not able to do that then we will give priority to senior most shareholders proxy only okay then we learned in case just in case one of the joint shareholders is also attending the meeting then we will give preference to him and not to the proxies then tell me what if the proxy has already voted then can the shareholder again put his vote no once a proxy votes shareholder you cannot vote again all right so this is it about the proxy discussion tell me guys who appoints the proxy three conditions you must be a member of the company you must have the right to attend and vote at the meeting you must be a member of the company and you must have the right to attend and vote at the meeting only then you can appoint a proxy a member who has the right to attend and vote at the meeting only you can appoint a proxy then we learned uh, can the uh, can can many people appoint the same person as proxy maximum 50 i can be a proxy of maximum 50 members and all of them put together should not be owning more than 10% voting power in the company then we learned that uh, uh, can proxy be counted in quorum no but can proxy vote in poll yes can proxy vote in show of hands also no can proxy demand a poll yes can proxy attend the meeting yes but proxy cannot speak at the meeting in the notice it should be clearly be written that shareholder if you want you can appoint a proxy this proxy whom the shareholder is appointing need not necessarily be a member but in section 8 companies proxy has to be a member the instrument appointing proxy we have to submit to the company at least 48 hours before the meeting and in case you want to inspect the proxy form you will have to inspect the proxy form uh, when you have to you have to give a notice to the company when 3 days in advance and you can inspect the proxy form when in last 24 hours before the meeting so three time limits i have to submit the instrument appointing proxy to the company at least 48 hours before the meeting if i want to inspect the proxy forms i have to inform the company 3 days in advance 3 days notice i have to give and when can i inspect the proxies only during 24 hours before the meeting okay then we learned after appointing proxy can we cancel his appointment yes we can cancel his appointment how can we cancel even before he can vote we can vote and we can cancel his appointment automatically or we can appoint some other person as proxy and submit the new proxy's form also at least 48 hours before the meeting then automatically the first proxy will get revoked okay now let's go to the next discussion guys voting voting can happen in various methods by the way can can we ever take away voting right from a shareholder we can take away voting right from a shareholder only in one case and that is let us say calls are in arrear he is not paying the call money and aoa authorizes if aoa authorizes and if he is not paying call money and all then we will take away his voting right otherwise we cannot take away voting right from a shareholder again when can we take away voting right from a shareholder only if calls are due and aoa authorizes if calls are due and aoa authorizes then only we can take away voting right from the shareholder how will we let him vote first obviously we will let him vote by show of hands but in case a poll is demanded then voting will happen by poll how many shareholders should demand the poll either the chairman on his own he will decide let us have a poll or demand should be made by how many shareholders shareholders holding at least 1/10th of the total voting power or holding shares of paid up value at least 5 lakh rupees either shareholders holding at least 1/10 of the total voting power or shareholders holding shares of at least 5 lakh rupees paid up value only when they demand a poll only then poll will be taken up once they demand a poll can they withdraw their demand also yes they can withdraw their demand at any time when should the poll be taken up guys if it is a poll for appointment of chairman or if it is a poll for adjournment of meeting these two polls have to be taken up immediately any other poll can be taken within 48 hours we get 48 hours time to arrange for the poll to conduct the poll we need scrutinizers these scrutinizers will be appointed by whom scrutinizers will be appointed by the chairman of the meeting what will these scrutinizers do 
they will do three things they will properly conduct the poll they will maintain proper records and they will prepare a report three things guys proper conduct proper records and report they will prepare a report in this report they will say they will write how many votes were in favor and how many votes were against see in this report they will not say resolution was passed or not passed that declaration who will make chairperson will make in the report they will just write how many votes were in favor how many votes were against and they will give this report to the chairperson within 7 days from the date on which the poll was taken okay what will these scrutinizers do in the poll they will maintain they will they will arrange for polling papers and they will give the polling papers to all the shareholders then in front of all the shareholders they will show see the box is empty and in front of everybody they will lock the polling box okay once a process voting once a polling process is over in the presence of two witnesses they will unlock the polling box they will take out all the votes and they will count this was voting by poll first we learned can we take away voting right from shareholders we said we can take away the voting right from shareholders only if calls are in arrear and the aoa authorizes only then we can take away the voting right from the shareholders in case we taking away the voting right from the shareholders please remember aoa should authorize and calls should be in arrear two conditions okay then we learned voting will always be done by show of hands first but only if a poll is demanded who will demand a poll either the chairman on his own he can decide let us take up a poll or a poll may be demanded by a shareholders who are holding at least 1/10 of the voting power or paid up value at least 5 lakhs come on guys everybody what are the two criteria either shareholders holding at least 1/10 of the voting power or shareholders holding shares of at least 5 lakh paid up value these many shareholders have to demand the poll only then poll will be taken up after demanding the poll after demanding the poll can they withdraw the poll also yes then we learned when should we take up the poll if they are demanding the poll we will see what are they demanding the poll for if they are demanding the poll for appointment of chairman or for adjournment of meeting that poll has to be taken up immediately all other matters we will give the company 48 hours time to prepare for the poll who will conduct the poll scrutinizers these scrutinizers three duties tell me the three duties guys number one they will properly conduct the poll number two they will maintain proper records about the poll and number three they will prepare a report now this report they will prepare and submit to whom to the chairman within how many days within 7 days what will this report contain how many votes in favor and how many votes against okay then we learned to conduct the poll the scrutinizers will arrange polling papers and will give to all the shareholders who are present in the meeting shareholders and even proxies can proxies also vote in poll you know this yes so polling paper will be given to the shareholders and to the proxies in front of everybody the scrutinizer will show see the polling box is empty and in front of everybody he will lock the polling box then after the polling process is over in the presence of two witnesses he will unlock the polling box and he will count the number of votes okay so this was it about voting by poll now coming to voting by electronic means is this mandatory in every company is electronic voting mandatory in every company no it is mandatory for all listed companies and it is mandatory for all those companies which have at least 1000 members is it mandatory for every company no it is mandatory for listed companies and it is mandatory for those companies which have at least 1000 members now in whenever whenever we are going to do e voting in the notice we have to mention that hey listen e voting facility is available this is your login id this is your password in case you are having any problem with the e voting whom can you contact details about the grievance officer all this has to be given in the notice in the notice we also have to mention that shareholder don't worry in case you are not able to put your vote electronically don't worry you can come to the meeting and in the meeting we will arrange voting for you in the meeting we will either arrange voting for you by giving you polling paper or in the meeting scrutinizers will help you with the e voting okay so what will we write in the notice that shareholders don't worry if you're not able to cast your vote electronically even in the meeting we will give you opportunity to vote in the meeting either we will give you polling paper and we will let you vote or in the meeting computers and all will be kept ready for you scrutinizers will help you do the voting okay now this uh, electronic voting period should be open for how many days it should be kept open for at least minimum 3 days and when should we close it we should close it on the preceding day at 5 pm we should close it once we close it on the preceding day 5 pm nobody should be able to cast a vote electronically after that 
even for e-voting, even here we need scrutinizers. Here scrutinizers are appointed by board of directors. These scrutinizers cannot be employees of the company, cannot be employees of the company. They have to be a CA, CS, CMA, lawyer, some reputed person whom the board thinks they will carry on the entire polling, entire e-voting process smoothly, fair and transparent manner. Okay. So what we should do here is, in case we are having scrutinizers and all, then even before the meeting can start, we should give the scrutinizer details about all those shareholders who have already voted electronically. See, we will not tell the scrutinizer whether they voted yes or no. We will just give the details, the names of the shareholders who have already casted their vote electronically. Why? Because shareholders who have already put their vote electronically tell me, will we again allow them to put their vote again in the meeting? No, right? So that is why before the meeting will start, we will give the scrutinizer the list of the shareholders who have already voted electronically. Okay, these shareholders, scrutinizers will make sure that they don't vote again. Then at the general meeting, uh, the scrutinizer will conduct the entire voting process. Only those shareholders who could not vote electronically, only they will vote. Once this voting is done, the scrutinizer will first count the votes which were cast at the meeting. Okay, then he will unlock the e-votes already cast in the presence of two witnesses. He will unlock the e-votes already cast and he will count. Then he will prepare a consolidated report. Why are we calling it consolidated report? Because he will consolidate the e-votes and the votes cast at the meeting. He will prepare a consolidated report and he will give to the chairman within three days. You tell me in poll, how much time we gave him? In poll, how much time we gave him to give the report? Seven days. In e-voting, how much time are we giving him to prepare the report? Only three days. There are seven days, here are three days. In both the reports, he will not write whether the resolution was passed or not. In both the reports, what will he write? In both the reports, he will just write how many votes in favor, how many votes against. All right, what will be the date of passing the resolution? The date of passing the resolution will not be the date of the report. Date of passing the resolution will not be the date when the chairperson is declaring the result. The date of passing the resolution will be the date on which the meeting is held. 100% clarity. Yes, e-voting shall we see once again. Quickly we'll run through e-voting. Come on guys, e-voting is it mandatory in every company? No, it is mandatory only for listed companies and companies which have at least 1000 members. Then we learned that in the notice, it should be clearly written that shareholders listen, e-voting facility is available. This is your login ID. This is your password. In case you have any complaint, who is a grievance officer, all those details have to be written in the notice. In the notice, we also have to write members listen. If you already put your vote electronically, you can't vote again in the meeting. But tell me, I already cast my vote electronically. Okay. Can I at least attend the meeting, please? Yes, I can attend the meeting. Answer another question. I already voted electronically. Can I appoint a proxy to attend the meeting on my behalf, please? No. Why not? No. Who can appoint a proxy? Only a member who has the right to attend and vote at the meeting. I am a member. I have the right to attend. But do I have the right to vote at the meeting? No, right. I have already cast my vote electronically. I don't have the right to vote at the meeting. So can I appoint a proxy? I can't appoint a proxy. Now understood. Then we learned that the, that the e-voting facility has to be kept open for minimum three days. It has to be closed on the preceding day at 5 p.m. After we close it, then nobody else should be able to cast the vote. Here also we have scrutinizer appointed by board. Scrutinizer will not be company's employee. The scrutinizer, we have to give him details about shareholders who have already cast their vote electronically. We will give him the list even before the meeting can start. He will make sure these people don't vote again. Then after the entire voting is done in the meeting also, first what will he count? First he will count the votes which were done at the meeting. Then he will count the e-votes. He will unlock the e-votes in the presence of at least two witnesses. He will prepare one consolidated scrutinizer's report and he will submit to the chairperson within three days. What will be the date of the meeting? Date of the date. What will be the date of the resolution? The date of the resolution will be the date on which the meeting was actually held. All right, guys. So under voting, we learned by poll, we learned by e-voting. Now coming to the last point under voting, voting by postal ballot. In postal ballot, sitting at home itself, using postal services, you are casting your vote. 
pin postal ballot sitting at home itself using the postal services you are casting your vote postal ballot will be mandatory only in these matters number one if you want to alter the object clause or if you want to elect directors if you want to change the registered office of your company from one city to another city if you want to buy back shares if you want to issue shares with differential rights if you want to vary the rights if you want to give loans more than a particular limit if you want to sell a unit if you want to sell a branch or an undertaking if you want to change the objects for which you've raised the money you've issued a prospectus and you've raised money saying you will use the money for steel business now you want to use the money for paper business you need approval of shareholders even for that postal ballot you need or if you want to convert public company into private company or vice versa for these matters postal ballot is mandatory but even for these matters postal ballot is not required if you are a one person company or if you have company up to 200 members so which means for these matters one person company and company with up to 200 members postal ballot not mandatory all other companies other companies means what other than opc other than com uh, other than opc and companies which have more than 200 members for those companies these matters postal ballot mandatory for whom is it not mandatory one person company and company up to 200 members what about other matters other matters depends upon the company if it wants it can do postal ballot otherwise don't do postal ballot depends upon the company but come what may in these two cases you cannot do postal ballot in these two matters you cannot do postal ballot number one ordinary business do you remember ordinary business guys consideration of financial statement auditor report board report declaration of dividend appointment of directors appointment of auditors and fixing their remuneration so for these ordinary businesses come what may no matter what kind of a company you are postal ballot not allowed number two there are some matters where you give the directors or auditors the right to be heard you give directors or auditors right to speak like for example if you want to remove the director if you want to remove the auditor you give him a right to speak right in these cases you cannot do the resolution by postal ballot these two matters the resolution has to be passed only in the meeting all right guys so uh, postal ballot what did we say in uh, for these matters it is mandatory to get the resolution passed only by postal ballot but even these matters postal ballot is not mandatory if i am a one person company or if i have up to 200 members then postal ballot not required other matters depends upon the company whether you want to do postal ballot or not but come what may ordinary businesses and all those matters where i have to give the directors and auditors right to be heard all those matters where i have to give my directors and auditors right to be heard in these matters i cannot do postal ballot okay now these in whenever a, a resolution has to be passed by postal ballot we have to tell the shareholders to send their yes or no vote to send their vote in such a way that it reaches the company within 30 days within 30 days from when company will be sending notice to all the shareholders right it doesn't matter when is the notice reaching the shareholder we will see when is the company sending the notice so from the date on which the company sent the notice from that date within 30 days the shareholders vote should reach the company see two things will happen number one company will send the notice to the shareholders okay and number two shareholders will send their vote to the company i don't care when the notice reached the shareholder i don't care when the shareholder sent the vote what are the only two things i care about when did the company send the notice when is the company receiving the vote the company should receive the vote within 30 days from the date on which the company sent the notice did you all understand this yes the, the shareholders have to send their vote in such a way that their vote reaches the company within 30 days from the date on which the company sent the notice we don't care when the shareholder received the notice we don't care when is the shareholder sending the notice the notice should reach the company within 30 days from the date on which the company sent the notice this has to be written in the notice then also remember even here we will appoint a scrutinizer even your board will appoint a scrutinizer even your scrutinizer should not be employee of the company he should be a reputed person whom the board thinks that he will carry on the entire process fair and transparent manner 
even here the scrutinizer will prepare a report and he will give to the chairman within seven days you tell me poll what was the time limit for report seven days right then uh, in e-voting what was the time limit for a uh, report three days and now in a uh, postal ballot what is the time limit for the report seven days seven three seven any votes that we receive after 30 days period and all we will not consider the any vote that we receive after 30 days period will be invalid vote so we will not count them four kinds of votes we may receive yes vote assent no vote dissent votes received member has voted partially assenting partially dissenting 50 shares he is owning 30 shares he is saying yes 20 shares he is saying no is this allowed by the way i own 50 shares for 30 shares can i vote yes and 20 shares can i vote no yes yes this is allowed this is called splitting of votes okay or they may be invalid votes invalid votes for example votes received late or votes the signature is not matching or votes where there's too much overwriting not able to understand whether yes vote or no vote okay guys so what are the concepts we learned under postal ballot postal ballot we said not mandatory for every company postal ballot we said it is mandatory only in these matters and that too only for companies which are not one person companies and companies which have more than 200 members if i'm a one person company if i'm a company with up to 200 members even for these matters postal ballot not required then we learn other matters depends upon the company but some what may ordinary businesses postal ballot not allowed matters where i have to give opportunity of being heard opportunity to speak to directors and auditors these matters also postal ballot not allowed then we learned it doesn't matter when did you receive the notice it doesn't matter when are you sending your vote what matters when did the company send the notice when is the company receiving the vote company should receive the vote within 30 days of sending the notice guys tell me this point tell me guys did everybody understand this point give me a confirmation everybody yes we will see when did the company send the notice within 30 days from that company should receive the vote okay guys then we learned that uh, even here we need scrutinizer appointed by board scrutinizer will prepare a report report will be submitted to the chairperson within seven days and then we learned about the four kinds of votes okay this was it about our discussion regarding the different types of voting now let us go to the different types of resolutions we have two resolutions ordinary resolution special resolution in ordinary resolution the number of votes in favor will be more than the number of votes against in uh, that is why ordinary resolution is also called what what is the other name for ordinary resolution simple majority not absolute majority simple majority and what is special resolution guys special resolution number of votes in favor should be at least what at least how many times number of votes in favor should be at least three times number of votes against did you notice this more than more than or equal to did you notice this yes so ordinary resolution special resolution two kinds of resolution ordinary resolution also called a simple majority number of votes in favor should be more than number of votes against number two special resolution number of votes in favor should be at least three times the number of votes against whenever i pass a special resolution whenever i pass a special resolution from the date of the resolution within 30 days i have to file a copy of the resolution with roc this is not applicable for ordinary resolution when, whenever i pass a special resolution within 30 days i have to file a copy of the resolution with roc tell me what was that one matter we learned which is which is applicable only for special business and not for ordinary business one matter we learned, one concept we learned, which was applicable only for special business and not for ordinary business. Can anybody recall? Very good, guys. Explanatory statement. Amazing this is. Explanatory statement, right? Now tell me, one concept which is applicable only in special resolution, not applicable in ordinary resolution. Filing with the ROC. Within 30 days, it has to be filed with the ROC only in special resolution and not in ordinary resolution. Okay, so ordinary resolution, number of votes in favor, more than the number of votes against. What if there is a tie in ordinary resolution? What if number of votes is equal to number of votes against? Then 
we will give a special vote called casting vote to whom to chairperson of the meeting only if dash authorizes only if aoa authorizes okay now tell me for many matters for many matters can we pass one single resolution no each matter separate separate resolution but then for all the matters put together we can pass one single resolution if the chairman desires condition one chairman is okay with it condition number two not even one member is objecting not even one member is saying no 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 separate separate resolution condition three they are not even demanding a poll condition number four not even one shareholder is voting against unanimous unanimous means what 100 percent votes are in favor 100% votes are in favor. If these four conditions are fulfilled, then multiple resolutions you can pass, multiple matters you can pass by one single resolution. Understood this discussion, everybody, guys? Yes, we'll, we'll uh, see this part once again. Yes, so many matters can be passed a resolution together. Generally, no. Generally, every matter, we need a special resolution. But when can you combine them all into one single resolution if four conditions are fulfilled? Condition number one, the chairman should be okay with it. Number two, not even one member should be objecting to it. Every Not even one member should be saying, no, 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 we want a separate resolution. Number three, no member is demanding a poll. And number four, unanimously, all the shareholders, everybody has voted yes. Everybody has voted in favor. Four conditions one last time please what is the first condition who is okay with it chairman is okay with it number two not even one member is demanding not even one member is objecting to it number three not even one member is demanding a poll and number four unanimous unanimous means what every shareholder is voting in favor 100 percent resolution all the four conditions fulfilled, then multiple matters, single resolution allowed. But come what may, can two directors be appointed in one single resolution? No. No. Can two directors be appointed in one single resolution? No. Other matters, you can combine. You can combine, you can pass one single resolution if these four conditions are fulfilled. But two directors cannot be passed by one single resolution. Okay. Then we have resolutions requiring special notice. Look at this um, discussion here. There are these three matters for which the shareholders are taking initiative. Generally, who takes initiative? The board. But these three matters, shareholders are taking initiative. What are the three matters? Number one, the shareholder is saying, auditor is anyways retiring. In his point, don't re in his place, don't reappoint him. Appoint anybody else, but don't reappoint him. Or second matter, shareholder is saying, auditor is anyways retiring. Don't reappoint him. In his place, appoint A, B, C and co. Or number three, if they want to become a director, if they want to stand for directorship. Or number four, if they want to remove a director. So totally four matters. Matter number one, auditor is anyways retiring. We are telling the company, don't reappoint him. Appoint anybody else, but don't reappoint him. Number two, Auditor is anyways retiring. In his place, let us appoint A, B, C and go. Number three, we want to stand for directorship. We want to become a director. Number four, let us remove the director. His term is not over even before that. Let us remove the director. For these four matters, special notice is required. Special notice is required means special notice from whom? From shareholders. Shareholders have to take initiative. How many shareholders? One or two shareholders are coming and telling the company, will the company do anything about it? No. Shareholders who are holding at least 1% of the total voting power or shareholders who are having at least 5 lakh rupees paid up value. Tell me something very similar. Where did you see? With only one small difference. Something very similar. With only one small difference, where did you see? Poll. Who can demand a poll? Shareholders holding at least 10% of the shares of the company or paid up value at least 5 lakhs. What is the only difference? There one tenth, here one percent. There one tenth, here one percent. There ten percent, here one percent. Okay, then uh, when when do, when should they send the notice to the company? If the meeting is going to be held on this date, they should send the notice at least 14 days in advance. But they should send the notice not earlier than three months. That is, in the last three months, they should be sending, but at least 14 days in advance. 
once the company receives the notice company will send a copy of the notice to all the shareholders within 7 days from the date of the meeting within 7 days company will send a notice to all the shareholders uh, within 7 days at least seven, at least 7 days before the date of the meeting if it is not possible to send to each and every shareholder at least 7 days before the date of the meeting what will we tell the company no problem you give it as an advertisement in one english newspaper one vernacular newspaper having wide circulation in the place where registered office is situated all right so very simple guys four matters what are the four matters auditor is anyways retiring please don't reappoint him please appoint somebody else in his place or auditor is anyways retiring please don't reappoint him let us appoint abc and co in his place or i want to become a director or let us remove the director even before his term is over for these four matters who takes initiative the shareholder takes an initiative right the shareholder takes an initiative for these four matters the shareholder will uh, how many shareholders shareholders holding at least 1% of the total voting power of the company or shareholders holding at least 5 lakh rupees paid up share capital they have to send special notice to the company when they will send the special notice to the company in the last 3 months before the meeting but at least 14 days in advance once they send the notice to the company company will pass on a copy of the notice to whom company will pass on a copy of the notice to all the shareholders at least 7 days before the meeting if it is not possible to pass on the notice at least 7 days before the date of the meeting then what will the company do give an advertisement in two newspapers one english newspaper one vernacular newspaper having wide circulation in the place where registered office is situated crystal clear with this discussion also guys yes then this is nothing but some resolutions which have to be filed with the roc for example we already know special resolutions have to be filed with the roc within how many days within 30 days same 30 days time limit for unanimous resolutions resolutions under section 179 subsection 3 voluntary winding up resolutions then board resolutions regarding appointment of managing director all these resolutions have to be filed with the roc within 30 days important ones special resolutions unanimous resolutions winding up resolutions managing director resolutions these have to be filed with the roc at least within 30 days it has to be filed okay come on guys we have three more concepts left it's almost time i have to catch a train also today but we have three more concepts left let us quickly finish off those three concepts okay we will finish off minutes first minutes of the meeting what are the minutes of the meeting they contain a fair and correct summary of what has happened in the meeting there are written record of the business transacted in the meeting they are like an evidence of what has been decided in the meeting minutes have to be prepared within how many days minutes have to be prepared within 30 days okay then listen this is the most important part of the minutes discussion guys who has the final decision making authority that what will enter the minutes and what will not enter the minutes only the chairperson the chairperson of the meeting he has the one he has the absolute discretion key word guys you can't lose this word he has absolute discretion he is the one who will decide what will enter the meeting and what will not enter the meeting no doubt minutes are a fair and correct summary of what has happened in the meeting but if he thinks something is defamatory if he thinks something is irrelevant or immaterial if he thinks something is detrimental to the company's interest did defamatory irrelevant immaterial detrimental defamatory irrelevant immaterial detrimental if he thinks any matter is defamatory to any person or irrelevant or immaterial or detrimental to the company then he can decide that i don't want to put this matter in the minutes book who is the only one who has the right to make this decision come on tell me guys the chairperson of the meeting he has what kind of discretion absolute discretion we said minutes contain fair and correct summary of the proceedings of the meeting these minutes contain a written record of what has happened in the meeting they are an evidence of what has happened in the meeting it has to be prepared within 30 days then coming to the next important point who will sign the meeting if it is board meeting minutes then chairman of that board meeting or chairman of next board meeting but if it is general meeting minutes chairman of the meeting has to sign in case he dies or in case he is not able to sign not chairman of next meeting then whom board of directors will authorize a person will authorize a director that director will sign then what if it is postal ballot resolution postal ballot resolution who has to sign the minutes book chairman of the board but what if the chairman of the board dies before signing or is incapable of signing then not the next chairman of the board again the board will have to appoint a director and that director will have to sign 
this is extremely important guys what is signing who will sign the minutes board meeting minutes committee meeting minutes either the chairman of this meeting or chairman of next meeting no problem but general meeting minutes chairman of that meeting if he is not able to sign then chairman of next meeting no if he is not able to sign then the board of directors will have to appoint one person one director that director will sign similarly postal ballot who is supposed to sign chairman of the board chairman of the board not able to sign he dies before signing then chairman of the then uh, chairman of the next meeting no then the directors have to authorize one person directors the board of directors have to appoint one director that director will sign all right guys then coming to the next point who will inspect the minutes book again important who can until now we have already seen two inspections remember sbo register who can inspect members can inspect for inspection itself we can charge a fee how much 50 rupees then second register of members annual return anybody can inspect but members beneficiary owners debenture holders are and all are inspecting will be charge fee no free others are inspecting we will charge 50 rupees fee now talking about minutes book minutes book who can inspect only members can inspect when they can inspect during business hours here for inspection no fee but can they ask for a copy? Yes. Hard copy, we will charge 10 rupees per page. We will charge maximum. Soft copy, free of cost. If they're asking for a copy, we have to give them the copy within seven working days. Last three years, minutes, they can ask as copy. Got it, guys? Simple, right? Inspection, who can inspect the minutes book? Only members. Just like register of SBO, even register of SBO, only members can inspect. Even this, only the members can inspect all right but when can they inspect they can inspect during the business hours for inspection can we charge a fee inspection we can't charge a fee but can they ask for a copy yes hard copy we can charge a fee how much 10 rupees per page we can charge a fee soft copy we can't charge any fee if they're asking us for a copy we have to give them the copy within seven days and last how many years minutes they can ask as a copy last three years minutes they can ask as a copy all right, then how long are we going to preserve the minutes book? We have to preserve the minutes book permanently, just like what else do we preserve permanently? Register of members, right? Annual return and debenture holders register. What was the period? Eight years here permanently. All right, guys, thorough with our minutes discussion, everybody. Yes, within 30 days, we have to prepare fair and correct summary. The only person who has absolute discretion is chairperson remember the three points did defamatory irrelevant immaterial and detrimental defamatory irrelevant immaterial detrimental can we learn who will sign the minutes board meeting minutes lenient either chairperson of that meeting or next meeting general meeting minutes and postal ballot minutes if the chairman is not able to sign then the board of directors will appoint some other director that director will sign then we learned about the inspection only members can inspect for inspection and all we can't charge a fee for copy we can charge a fee okay guys and preserve the minutes book permanently all right now coming to the last two concepts under the uh, the meetings discussion agm and egm annual general meeting once in every year is agm required for one person company also no one person company agm not required within how much time you have to hold the agm we have three time limits out of three time limits we will pick whichever is earliest number one between two agms maximum gap 15 months number two whenever the financial year ends within six months we have to hold the agm number three each calendar year we have to hold one agm Okay, so two, between two AGMs gap, 15 months, then uh, when uh, we have to hold the AGM within six months from the end of the financial year. And number three, we must have one AGM in every year. So three time limits, we will pick whichever is the earliest. In case we are not able to hold within this much time, we can go to the ROC. ROC will give us how much extra time? ROC will give us three months extra time. But if this is the first AGM, when should I hold the first AGM? The whole first AGM, only one time limit. What is that one time limit? Within nine months from the end of the year. First AGM, no extra time limit also. Understood guys? AGM not required for one person company. For AGM, three time limits. Out of three time limits, whichever is earliest. Number one, between two AGMs, maximum gap 15 months. Then AGM should be held within six months from the end of the year. Number three, there must be at least one AGM in every calendar year. 
out of the three time limits, I will pick the earliest. That is going to be the last day on which I'm supposed to hold the AGM. If I'm not able to hold the AGM within this much time, I can go with the ROC, ask for extra time, maximum three months. But in case it is first AGM, first AGM only one time limit within nine months from the end of the year, first AGM, no concept of extension. Then when should the AGM be held? It should be held during business hours. It cannot be held on a holiday. It has to be held either at the registered office or any other place, but same city, town or village where the registered office is situated. If it is an unlisted company, it can be held anywhere else in India also. But for that, consent of all members is required. Whenever we need consent of all members, 100% consent we need, then what do we call it? Then we call it unanimous resolution. Okay, so where should the AGM be held? At the registered office or any other place but same city, town or village where registered office is situated or if it's an unlisted company, it can be held anywhere else in any other city also but in India. All right, guys, then we have to prepare an AGM report. AGM report concept applicable only for listed companies. A report saying that, yes, meeting has been held according to the rules and regulations of the Companies Act. Who has to sign this AGM report? Chairman has to sign. In case he is not able to sign, two directors will sign, one of whom is managing director and company secretary will sign. This report has to be filed with the ROC within 30 days from the conclusion of the AGM. Do not write within 30 days of AGM. You will write within 30 days of conclusion of AGM. A report on AGM, very important. Don't compromise here. Applicable only for listed companies. Then in this report, what do we have to write? In this report, we have to write that meeting has been convened, held and conducted according to the rules and regulations of this act. Then this report has to be filed with the ROC when? Within 60 days from what? With, uh, sorry, within 30 days from what? Within 30 days from the conclusion of the AGM. Who will sign the minutes? Who, who will sign this report, guys? Chairman will sign. What if the chairman is not able to sign? Then two directors, one of whom should be managing director and company secretary of the company. Extremely important concept. Report on AGM. Do not compromise here. Okay. Applicability. Every listed company. Then uh, it, it has to be uh, prepared by only listed companies. Who will sign? Chairman. Or if he's not able, two directors or out of which one should be managing director and company secretary. Remember 30 days, 30 days from conclusion of AGM. Tell me for what the time limit is 60 days from AGM. Here, report on AGM, the limit is 30 days. For which concept the limit is 60 days from AGM. Amazing guys, you all are doing so well. Perfect answers you all are giving me and you will return making me so happy. And you will return 60 days, report on AGM 30 days. In case we are not holding the AGM, then anybody can go and complain to NCLT. NCLT will order the company to hold the AGM. If NCLT is ordering the company to hold the AGM, NCLT will give its own directions. In those directions, NCLT can also say that just one member present, that itself is quorum, go ahead. NCLT can give any directions. NCLT can also say that quorum is just one member. Okay, guys, so this was it about AGM. AGM, we learned the time limits. We learned extra three months, no extension for first AGM. Then we learned when and where we have to hold the AGM. Then we learned about the report on the AGM. And finally, we learned about NCLT's order. Till here, fine. I'm going a little fast in the AGM part. But did you all understand? Give me a confirmation. The AGM part, I went a little faster. But you all still followed, right? Perfect. Now listen to the EGM discussion, guys. EGM, who calls an EGM? Either the board of directors can call the EGM or NCLT can call the EGM or the board of directors can call the EGM because members are requesting. Board of directors calling EGM is normal. What is important here? Members are requesting the board. Members are requesting the board, please call an EGM for us. If members are requesting the board, how many members will have to request? Members holding at least one-tenth of paid-up share capital. One-tenth, same like poll. Okay, not one percent. One percent in special notice, one-tenth in poll and here. So when the when the when shareholders holding one tenth of the share capital are requesting the board, then the board will call an EGM for them. In case the shareholders are requesting the board, the board should call the meeting within 21 days and they must actually hold the meeting within 45 days. That is, once the, once the shareholders request the board, please call a meeting for us. From the date of requisition, within 21 days, the board should send the notice 
and ask for the meeting to be conducted. And from the date of requisition, within 45 days, they must actually hold the meeting. Did you understand calling and holding? What's the difference? Calling the meeting means they must give the notice within 21 days and they must actually hold the meeting within 45 days. But what if they don't do this? Then no problem. Requ the persons who requested, the members who requested, what will I call them? Requisitionists. The requisitionists, they themselves can hold the meeting. What if the requ uh, what if the board is not calling the meeting like this? Then the requisitionists, they themselves can hold the meeting. They themselves can call and hold the meeting within how much time? Within three months. All right. To call and hold the meeting themselves, expenses they will be incurring. Those expenses they can claim from the company. Company will deduct from whom? Company will deduct from share the director's remuneration. Company will deduct from director's remuneration. Okay. So in case shareholders holding at least one tenth of the capital want, if these shareholders want, they can request the board that please call a meeting for us. If they are requesting, board has to call the meeting within 21 days and actually hold the meeting within 45 days. If they don't hold like this, then what if they don't hold like this? Then the requisitionists, they themselves can hold the meeting within how much time? Within three months. For this meeting, whatever expenses they are incurring, they can claim reimbursement from the company. Company will claim from whom? Company will deduct from whom? From the director's remuneration. Even EGM during working hours, even EGM only on business days, only on working days cannot be held on holidays. In case... We, anybody goes and requests the NCLT or even on its own motion, NCLT can also ask the company to hold EGM. Even your NCLT can give any direction. NCLT can also give a direction that quorum is only one. All right, guys. And finally, whatever we learned under meetings, all this is not applicable to one person company. One person company, only one member. He itself can make a decision and he can inform the company what decision he has made. That itself is resolution passed. All right. So with this, guys, I come to an end with the meeting discussion. The AGM and EGM part, no doubt, I went a little fast. In case you guys do not understand, you can reach out to me on this number anytime and you can get it clarified. You can WhatsApp your doubts to me and you can get it clarified, the AGM and EGM part. All right. So shall we close here for today? I'm hoping the revision was at least of some benefit for you. Quickly, we've run through the entire chapter. I have not left any one concept also. The entire chapter we have revised once. Quickly, we have revised. Make sure you make the most of the session. All right. I will uh, make sure the session is uploaded on my YouTube channel. I will share the link also on my Telegram channel. So in case any of you was not able to attend this chapter, you can see it from there. Okay, I really have to rush now. I have a train to catch. So I will uh, see you again for our income tax session. We'll be having a session regarding PGBP and capital gains. Thank you guys. Bye-bye.